instruction, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Matthew Eugene and I'm the chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today on Entro 1208A, Entro 2020, Resort 1039A, and Resort 1040. Today, the committee will be hearing Entro 1208A, sponsored by Council Member Rosenthal, in relation to prohibiting employers from posting job listings without minimum, minimum and maximum salary information. Pay disparity based on race and gender is something we as a society have been working to address for generations. Through many efforts to ensure pay equity between men and women have been made, the way gap still persists. In fact, research shows that this gap has changed very little over the years. As in 2020, women still earn 84% of what men earn. Additionally, intersectional identities, including a race, affected the wage gap. It is apparent that the gender wage gap is more accurate for women of color. While the wage gap for white women working in the United States was 79% as of 2021, the wage gap for black women was 64%, 57% for Latinas, and 82% for Asian women. The movement to increase pay transparency transparency seeks to increase fairness for job applicants who are otherwise calculating their salary expectation in a vacuum. Entro 12 or 8 would have increased pay transparency by disclosing salary ranges for advertiser positions. The committee will also be hearing and through 2020, sponsored by Council Member Rosenthal, in relation to captioning at moving picture theater. According to 2019 data, there are over 160,000 deaf or hard hearing people living in New York City. Also, there are many legal protections for these residents, including federal and local law, deaf and hard of hearing and New Yorkers still face constant battles to access things that all the New Yorkers enjoy more easily. One such activity is going to the movie. While federal rules do require that movie theaters are equipped with closed captioning and audio description technology, movie theaters are not mandated to provide such technology or services unless a viewer requires it. And screen captioning can be either in an up or closed format. When captions are open, they appear on the screen for all viewers to see lacks title. When they are closed, the captioning is turned on or off, and a secondary device is needed to view them. Advocates argue that this unfairly places responsibility on the viewer. Survey show that many people with a hearing loss enjoy using open caption when they are available. And through 2020, 
would offer more accessibility to members of the deaf community, allowing them to more easily enjoy a simple pleasure that many of us take for granted. Additionally, the committee will be hearing resolution 1039A and 1040, sponsored by Council Member Baron. With resolution 1039A, call upon the New York State Legislature to pass in the governor to sign A2619A slash S 7215 in relation to establishing the New York State Commission, Community Commission on Reparations Remedies to examine the impact of the institution of slavery subsequently racial and economic discrimination against African Americans and recommend appropriate remedies. Reso 1040 calls upon the United States Congress to pass and the president to sign S1083 slash HR40 in relation to establishing the commission to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans to examine financial and other impacts of slavery and continue the discrimination and recommend appropriate remedies. The National Co Coalition for Black for Reparation in America defines reparations as a process of rep repairing, healing, and restoring a people in, in jail because of the group identity and in violation of their fundamental human rights by government, corporations, institutions, and families. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 24.3 percent of New York City population identified as Black or American. This means that nearly a quarter of the city populations would stand to benefit from the exploration of this process. Black and African Americans in the United States face a disproportionate amount of poverty and are generally less financially secure when compared to the other groups. After hundreds of years of mistreatment and inequity, slavery, segregation during the the reconstruction of Jim Crow eras and past and present institutionalized racism and unequal distribution of wealth as stone. Opportunities for financial wealth and growth among African Americans. Today, the average white family in the United States has a roughly 10 times greater wealth when compared to the average Black and African-American family. A New York City Community Commission on Reparation Remedies will seek to explore the best method for reparation while acknowledging the injustice and cruelty of a slavery that took place in New York and the need to remedy is impacted. As a similar effort at the federal level would identify the action of state and federal government in supporting the institution of slavery, discrimination, and uh, the private and public sectors, and uh, the persistent negative effect of the policies on the life of Black and African American. I would like to thank my the, the staff who have worked what? Hello. Hello. We can hear you. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, all right. I would like to talk uh, to thank the committee staff. That's why we Ghana Party Community Council, we are UV policy analyst and Jack Kemp financial analyst. And also, I would like to thank also my staff, Melissa Wilson. Now, I would, talk, uh, I would like to take the opportunity also to welcome my colleagues, a, for, a former council member, Charles Barons, and now assembly member. Welcome back, uh, Council Member ba uh, Assembly Member Baron. And now let me turn it over to Council Member Anis Baron to give our uh, opening remarks. Council Member Baron, please. Hello. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to other colleagues that are here and to the panelists that are here as well as the community to talk about these issues. Uh, I'm here to talk about the resos that I'm introducing, which are 1039A and Reso 1040. They're similar in nature. 1039 is directed at the state and 1040 is directed at the uh, federal government. What we're talking about is telling the full story you know, when we have hearings and trials, the, you're affirmed to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And until all of the elements, all of the components of our history and our accomplishments and our contributions are acknowledged, then we have only got half-truths, and a half-truth is a half-lie. So what we're calling on is to support those legislative issues, matters that have been presented in the state and also in Congress. When I went to school eons ago, we never were told that New York City was in fact one of the prime largest slaveholding states in the United States. It was second in terms of the population that was held in captivity, that was tortured, that had no protections under the law, that were state, they were subjected to state sanctioned atrocities. And we often think about those kinds of issues as confined to the South, but that's not in fact limited to the South. So it wasn't until I was a mature adult and did research on my own that I really became aware of the fact that it was here in New York that enslaved Africans were used, their skilled labor was used to form the docks, to clear the forest, to produce the ironworks, to till the fields, and to lay that road, yes, Broadway, that goes from downtown Manhattan all the way, at least to Westchester that I know of. All of that contributed to the economic wealth of New York City, because we were considered commodities. We had no protections. We were chattel slavery. We feel and we understand that this is supported by both the United Nations and other international bodies, that this was a crime against humanity. We want to call for the study of all of the impact of what happened during those hundreds of years that we were enslaved and the impact that still exists today in terms of the economic disparity, in terms of the emotional toll, and in terms of the discrimination and Jim Crow laws that were a part of the history of this country. So we're calling on that. Uh, in 1711, New York City established the first slave market down by the docks uh, where African-Americans and indigenous people were also sold. And we feel that all of the conditions that are manifested today are in fact residual effects from that long-standing practice of enslavement of African-Americans in particular, and indigenous people as well. The impact is significant. It was manifested in other policies that this country instituted, the war on drugs, a mass incarceration, all of that was targeted at this population of black people. And we want all of this to be included in a study uh, so that we can understand the extent, the, broad, the broadness of what it was that happened 
the impact of what it is, and what kinds of remedies can be examined to make those people and their descendants whole from the atrocities that they suffered. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I look forward to the discussion and invite my colleagues who are here to sign on to both of these resolutions, Reso 1039 and Reso 1040. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Councilmember Bound, for your uh, remarks. Thank you. Now I would like to uh, turn it over to Councilmember Rosenthal for some remarks. Councilmember Yep, thank you so much. And apologies if there's background noise. Um, I just want to start by saying, Councilmember Barron, Thank you, as always, for leading the way here. And, you know, you always thread into what you're talking about education, education, and what you're bringing here, your resolutions, is knowledge. And with knowledge comes power. So I just want to thank you for your resolutions. I think I'm already signed on, but um, thank you for always um, educating people and opening the door to more education. So good morning. My name is Helen Rosenthal. Um, I want to thank uh, Chair Eugene um, for holding this very important hearing and including my bills intro 128 for pay range transparency and intro 2020 for open captions in movie theaters. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. The first bill, intro 1208, will require that job listings in New York City include a maximum, a minimum and maximum salary. Employers who do not disclose a salary range for open positions will be engaging in unlawful discriminatory practice. Salary transparency is an actionable way to create a more equitable workplace, both leveling the playing field for job applicants and helping to identify and address systemic pay inequities. Lack of upfront pay range disclosures necessitates a salary negotiation in which the employer has the clear upper hand. This often results in lower wages for women and people who are black and brown upholding decades of systemic inequity and bias in hiring. Studies show that women net seven to 25% lower pay rates than men when the rate is arrived at by negotiation. Lack of upfront pay disclosure can also be especially harmful in the case of low wage jobs making it more likely that candidates will accept a salary they simply cannot afford to live on. New Yorkers desperately seeking employment and at the end of a long process of applications and interviews are more likely to explore terms than have they know about those terms in it. Let's face it, lack of salary transparency is both discriminatory and anti-worker. Every New Yorker should have the right to determine whether they will be able to support themselves and their family when they apply for a job. It's time to level the playing field and restore some dignity to New Yorkers seeking employment. The second of my bills being heard today is intro 2020 which will mandate open captioning for at least half of motion picture screenings theaters. Open captioning or on-screen captioning is familiar to those of us who enjoy foreign films and our subtitles. Roughly one in five New Yorkers, right, 
20% suffers from deafness, ranging from moderate to total. Two thirds of those experiencing deafness are under the age of 25, of 65. Two thirds experiencing deafness are under the age of 65. It's important to let that sink in. Such a significant segment of the population deserves to enjoy fully movies with ease. The Americans with Disability Act currently requires closed caption systems in movie theaters. But long-term experience has shown that the equipment needs in order to be able to uh, see or hear what's going on, it fails far too often. This unfairly burdens users who must request and return viewing devices um, and pose it because the devices are just passed on to the next user. Providing open captioning is an easy, inexpensive, and more sanitary alternative for cinema actors. It is not in overall movie attendance when scheduled along with uncaptioned screenings. Open captioning in movie screenings also great benefits the many New Yorkers who have limited English language profi proficiency. I'm open to making some tweaks to both the bills and I look forward to testimony from the administration and the public. So if you have not done so already, please submit any written testimony to the city council at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you, Chair Eugene. Before I pass it back to you, um, uh, you who are watching at home, the people who are going to speak today can see each other. So I can see some of the people who know our deaf or hard of hearing. And we um, conventionally set up a system so they could uh, read either through CART or ASL what um, is happening in this conversation. And I would just ask for those who are deaf or hard of hearing, could you just raise your hand so I can know you can hear, see this conversation? Okay, I am, oh, one hand is up, thank you. Um, and my system is not totally uh, working. Um, if anyone is having a problem, and most of you know me, just text me, and I will try to help um, figure out how to make this system work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Eugene. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, I don't know if Assembly Member Barron has a statement also. Committee Council, I yes, don't know if can. Assembly Member Barron yes. has a statement. Could you hear me? Yes, hello. Hello, mm -hmm. could you hear me? Yes, Assembly Member. You have okay, a thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity, and I'm looking forward to coming back to the council and have a good time with you uh, and others who might still be around. But thank you so much for, for this opportunity. You're very welcome, and welcome back. Yes, and I think it's a timely coming back, because as I come back, uh, Thomas Jefferson exits with his statue. So I've been fighting that for 20 years. So. I appreciate the assembly finally doing that. And he was a slaveholder. But I wanna thank you so much. And I wanna particularly thank uh, council member Inez Barron for the great piece that she laid out and her support of the bill and the legislation. What I'd like to do in just a few minutes, I wanna read my press release and then have a few words and then I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. 
This is the press statement that we had made when my bill was passed. On June 9th, 2021, history was made in the New York State Assembly when the Assembly passed by a vote of 103 to 45, the New York State Community Commission on Reparations Remedies. I put emphasis on remedies. The uniqueness of this bill is that it establishes a majority community commission on reparations remedies. The community will have six appointees, two from the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, also known as NCOBRA, two from the December 12th movement, and two from the Institute of the Black World. These are groups that have been fighting for decades for reparations. The state will have five appointees, one from the governor, two from the assembly, and two from the Senate. The bill was introduced in 2017. Needless to say, there was resistance, but due to our persistence, massive demonstrations for restorative justice and reparations becoming the defining issue of the 21st century. Speaker Carl Hasty and the New York State Assembly passed our bill in 2021. Now we must turn up the heat on the Senate to follow suit. The same as Senate bill, Bill S7215, prime sponsored by Jabari, Senator Jabari Brisport, is what needs to be passed in the Senate. The commission will be charged with the responsibility of determining the amount, the form, and who shall receive reparations in the state. New York City, as the councilman mentioned, was the second largest slaveholding city in the country. Only Charleston, South Carolina had more. African people built the infrastructure and the economic foundation of New York's parasitic predatory colonial capitalist system. A crime has been committed, a people have been injured, and compensation is long overdue. They stole us, they sold us, they owe us, we say reparations now. I'd like to finally say that New York City was established as a city, some say 1624, some say 1625, some say 1626, but around there it was established by the Dutch. They say established, they robbed, stole the indigenous people's land, the Manhattas, the Lanape, those were the indigenous people on this land. They stole it from them, put them on reservations and called it New Amsterdam, and then went and stole us from Africa to build the economic foundation of this capitalist system. So when we talk of reparations, we're talking of that early beginning. So from that point to 1827, New York City was involved in slavery. It abolished slavery in 1827, but it did not abolish the practice. It continued to 1840. Right here in my beloved East New York, there's a street named Skank Avenue. The Skank family was the largest slaveholders in Brooklyn. And so many of the street names in Brooklyn and all over the city are named after slaveholders, Jefferson, Washington, and so many others. So when we go forward with this and we see that, and not only did we build the foundation of the capitalist system, but the devastating impact it had on our community. Uh, there's many writings on the post-traumatic slave syndrome and the debt books written on what's old, but the psychological impact the cultural impact, can you imagine being stripped of your culture, not knowing where you came from or who you are and you have to reestablish yourself? Dr. Clark said, we are not who we are based upon where the boats dropped us off in South America, North America, and the West Indies. We are who we are based upon where the boats picked us up from and we all were picked up from Africa. That's why we consider ourselves an African people. So that kind of devastation that impacted us during the middle pack, pack, passage, millions of us died on the plantations, 
millions of us died. And to this day, we are still dying at the hands of the police and poverty. So we have to fight for this reparations. The New York City <coughs> problem, NYPD, was established in 1845 as a slave catching patrol to put us back into slavery. So I want to encourage us to pass this legislation to study reparations and understand that a people have been injured and compensation can't be determined by the state or by those who were partook in the slave trade or the benefits of it. The compensation has to be determined by this commission, this community commission, and that should determine what it should be. Reparations isn't giving us scholarships, isn't giving us more uh, jobs. Those are things we're supposed to have as taxpaying citizens to this state. Separate from that, reparations is a debt owed. And some say it's in the trillions and billions, and some say it'll be land, it'll be cash. The commission will determine that. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Thank you to this body for uh, entertaining or hearing on this bill, and hopefully it will pass along with what we do in the state. Thank you very much, Assembly Member Barron. Now I want to turn it over to the committee council to introduce the, the panelists. Thank you, Chair Eugene. Um, my name is Jace Reganapathy. My pronouns are she and her. I am counsel to the Committee on Civil and Human Rights, and I will be moderating this hearing. Uh, before we begin, <clears throat> I do want to acknowledge um, Council Member Bar um, Lander, who also was present at the hearing. Uh, now, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. At this hearing, we will first be inviting testimony from the Department of Civil and Human Rights, from the Commission on Civil and Human Rights, followed by testimony from the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, and then members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. For all panelists, when called to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Joanne Camp Ward, City Commission on Human Rights, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs, and from Ronald Wooden Jr., ASL Direct Supervisor for the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. We will also be joined for questions by Katherine Greenberg from the City Commission on Human Rights Special Counsel. At this time, I will administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your hands. the full truth and nothing but the truth before this and to respond honestly to member Commissioner Ward. I do. Supervisor Ward? Yes, I do. Special Counsel Green. I do. At this time, I'd like to invite Deputy Commissioner Ward to present their testimony. Good morning, Chair Eugene, um, and members of the Civil and uh, of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. I'm Joanne Kamuf Ward, uh, Deputy Commissioner of Policy and External Affairs at the New York City Commission on Human Rights, and my pronouns are she and her. Uh, it's my pleasure to join all of you today to testify in support of the intent of Intro 208A, which would amend the city's administrative code to require employers to post the salary range on job postings as described by the chair um, and sponsor, Councilperson Helen Rosenthal, both previously. 
We've submitted longer testimony and writing, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Catherine Greenberg, special counsel at the commission. As many of you know, the commission is the local civil rights enforcement agency that enforces compliance with the city's human rights law. <clears throat> One of the broadest and most protective anti-discrimination and anti-harassment laws in the country with 27 protected categories, which cover housing, employment, and public accommodations. By statute, the commission has two main functions. First, the commission's law enforcement bureau enforces the city human rights law by investigating complaints of discrimination from the public, initiating its own investigations on behalf of the city and utilizing testing to help identify violations of the law. Second, through the Community Relations Bureau, which is comprised of community service centers in each of the city's five boroughs, the commission provides workshops and trainings um, for New Yorkers on rights and obligations of businesses, employers, and housing providers under the human rights law, working with community partners and sister agencies. In the last six and a half years of this administration, the commission has implemented over 30 amendments to the city human rights law. The law has been expanded to include one of the nation's first salary history inquiry bans, prohibit cr criminal history, discrimination in employment, and to expand protections against sexual harassment, among many more. Additionally, our law prohibits retaliation against individuals who seek to oppose discrimination, file a discrimination complaint, or participate in related investigations. In fiscal year 21, the commission resolved 896 cases and assessed a record $9.74 uh, million in damages and penalties for violations of the human rights law. In addition to resolving cases for monetary relief, the commission has shaped remedies to repair the harm experienced by individuals and communities impacted by discrimination. For example, in cases of employment discrimination, the commission has negotiated resolutions that require respondents to invest in paid internships, apprenticeships, and create pipeline opportunities for underrepresented groups in particular industries. The commission has established a cooperative approach to businesses and public accommodations to foster human rights compliance by improving policies and practices rather than just levying fines. The commission staff remain steadfast in efforts to vindicate New Yorkers' human rights amidst a pandemic. However, discrimination remains a reality. In fiscal year 21, the agency received 9,055 reports of discrimination. Consistent with prior years, the most reported instances of discrimination relate to disability, gender, and race. Some discrimination is intentional. Yet discrimination can also be the result of practices that have a disproportionate impact on particular individuals and groups. The city human rights law seeks to eliminate barriers to equity where they exist and to strengthen dignity and equality for all New Yorkers. The commission staunchly supports pay equity as well as the enactment of legislation that increases pay transparency, which is vital for equity. The city's human rights law already contains several provisions that protect against unequal treatment in the terms and conditions of employment, including compensation. These protections apply to most employers and prohibit discrimination on the basis of protected characteristics, including but not limited to actual or perceived age, race, national origin, gender, disability, and sexual orientation. With respect to disparate pay, the city human rights law provides that's an unlawful discriminatory practice for an employer, employee, or agent thereof to discriminate against someone in compensation or in terms, conditions, or privileges of their employment because of their protected characteristic. Discrimination in pay or terms of employment, however, can be difficult to detect. As employees are often hesitant to share salary information with colleagues and often do not realize and are unable to know that they're being compensated at a lower rate for comparable work. Recognizing this reality, a number of state and local governments, including in New York, are taking steps to advance pay equity. As I mentioned, the New York City Human Rights Law was expanded in 2017 to ban inquiries into salary history for the purpose of encouraging pay equity. And that amendment to the human rights law recognizes that inquiring about salary history during the hiring process often creates a cycle of inequity and discrimination in the workplace, which can perpetuate lower salaries 
specifically for women and people of color. Intro 1208A represents a welcome step towards leveling the playing field for employees and for women and people of color, as, as well as other New Yorkers who've historically and are currently harmed by wage disparities. Wages define what's affordable for families, determines quality of life in the short term, and can impact one's ability to accrue equity over generations. We think that action to address pay inequity today will have long-term benefits. And that's why in 2019, the commission convened a public hearing on pay equity, working with partners that include the city's Commission on Gender Equity and the Department of Consumer and Workplace Protection to gather input from New Yorkers and publish a hearing report. This hearing and our work in this area have together emphasized that federal, state, and local legislative and policy changes are needed to further foster fairness and equity. The 2019 hearing testimony testimony underscored that although New York City has robust workplace protections, workers across and within industries continue to be inequitably compensated. Testimony emphasized that New Yorkers experience wage disparities as a result of persistent differential treatment in the workplace based on gender, class, race, immigration status, national origin, gender identity, and other identity characteristics. Testimony also reflected that a lack of transparency and compensation enables pay inequity to persist. And in jurisdictions where there is mandated wage transparency, the pay gap between men and women has been shown to decrease um, and more women are hired in, and promoted into leadership. Testimony during the public hearing in 2019 resulted in other recommendations as well. Um, not only increased transparency around pay, um, and posting salary ranges, but support for greater reporting of pay data and de demographic information. Testimony also suggested there's a need for greater services and support for individuals that have been most impacted by wage disparities and underpayment, including raising the minimum wage, expansion of affordable childcare access, and outreach and training programs that enhance career development. The commission looks forward to working with city council as well as sister agencies to fulfill the intent of intro 1208A and to working on complementary initiatives that promote gender and racial equity. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Supervisor Wooden to present their testimony. Good morning. Can you can I can you see me? We're yes, just making sure the interpreter can see. Yes. Good morning, Chair Eugene and members of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. My name is Ronald Wooden Jr. And I am the ASL Direct Supervisor for the New York City Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, in short, MLPD. It is my pleasure to join you today in support of introduction number 2020, which would require movie theaters to present with open captions on screen. MOPD supports introduction 2020, which would require movie theaters to present a certain percentage of movies with open captions on screen. Right now, there are more than 175,000 deaf and hard of hearing people who reside here in New York City. This bill would be a definite game changer for our movie going experience. Currently, only closed caption is provided at most movie theaters. With closed captioning, deaf and hard of hearing patrons who go to the theater must follow what is being said on devices provided by the movie theater, such as captioning or small screen that is attached to our seats, which shows the words. But the, that equipment does not provide deaf and hard of hearing people who go to the theater with full access and enjoyment of the movies. Most of the time, those devices do not work. As a deaf person, 
I have oftentimes had to get up during the movie theater, walk to the front desk, ask for another piece of equipment if available because mine isn't working. During this time, I have to try and explain what's happening and I've already now missed 15 minutes or more of the movie. And then when I'm back, there's no guarantee that the new equipment is working. Many times by the end of the movie, deaf patrons leave and just say, well, I'll watch it when it comes out on TV or a different time. The situation does not allow a deaf person like myself to join hearing friends or family in going to a movie experience. Also, the equipment, even if they do work, can be very uncomfortable. For example, in regards to captioning glasses, they can cause a variety of different issues. Headaches, swelling around the eyes and nose, dizziness. Plus, the equipment is shared between many different people, so who knows if they sanitize it afterwards. Open captioning is by far superior. With open captioning, your eyes can stay on the screen at all times, allowing deaf or hard of hearing people to enjoy the movie the same ex with the ex same experience that hearing people do. Open captioning works 100% of the time without any issues, and there's no sharing of equipment or devices. The number of deaf and hard of hearing people who attend a movie showing is limited because the devices are limited as well with how many the theater has. So if you go to the movies with say 10 people, you have to hope that they have enough equipment for everyone and that no one's left not able to enjoy the movie or having to go another time. Finally, open captioning not only benefits deaf and hard of hearing community, it can also help kids learn how to read or other people learn English. We understand that open captioning is growing in popularity, particularly among young people. On behalf of MOPD and the deaf and hard of hearing New Yorkers, I urge you to vote for the passage of this bill, which will make New York City fairer and more inclusive by helping ensure that everyone going to the movies has equal access and an enjoyable experience. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. We look forward to further discussions with the council on this legislation and further protections for the deaf and hard of hearing community. Thank you. Thank you. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Eugene. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chair Eugene, you may begin your questions. Chair, you're on mute. We should be able to hear you now, Chair. You hear me now? Yes. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, thank all the speakers. Uh, I want to thank you for your statements and your presentations. <clears throat> Uh, Deputy Commissioner from the Civil and Human Rights Commission, 
we you mentioned that uh in new york city people are, are impacted by the inequity but could you tell us according to your observations which group are most impacted by the pay inequity in new york city thank you very much for um for the question um, the landscape for pay equity reflects similar disparities to what we see national, nationally. As, and as one recent study has indicated, um, women are average, on average are paid roughly 82 cents for every dollar that white non-Hispanic men are paid, while black women are paid 62 cents, native women are paid 57 cents, and Latinx women are paid 54 cents. I think as I referenced the testimony that we heard in our hearing in 2019 um, emphasized that a number of groups are impacted on the basis of gender, class, race, immigration status, national origin, gender identity and sexual orientation. And of course, as referenced, these are intersectional challenges. So individuals who hold more than one of these identities are more impacted, right? If you're a, a woman of color or a trans woman, um, you will have a different experience um, than someone um, uh, who holds a different set of identities. Uh, uh, inequity in New York City is a fact. We are seeing it every single day and we talk about it all the time. But currently, could you tell us about the remedies that the employees have in New York City to face this uh, pay inequity, to overcome this and to end all that? Sure, and I'm gonna turn to my uh, colleague, um, Catherine Greenberg, to talk about the remedies are that are available when we find um, that there has been um, discrimination in, in wages. Thank you, and thank you for the question. So the New York City human rights law does prohibit employers from paying workers less because of their national origin, their race, their gender, their membership in a protected class. And there are state and federal laws that have similar protections, although the federal law only applies to larger employers, so employers with 15 or more employees. Um, I think what would really be added by this bill is the transparency and information sharing that employees would gain and understanding what their salary is likely to be and how it might compare to peers in the same or a similar role. There are state and federal laws that also provide wage-based protections as opposed to discrimination protections for workers who experience pay inequity, who are paid less than somebody who's in the same or a similar job. There are fewer remedies for those laws, however. There are less types of money damages that are available for people who experience the discrimination. And similarly, the protections are only there for people who are actually paid differently, not those who lack access to information about how their pay compares to their colleagues. Well, yeah, I think the commissioner mentioned that uh, the Human Rights Committee in New York City is also a reinforcement uh, agency also. And we know that, that there are uh, federal uh, regulations that, you know, uh, should be applied when uh, we talk about with respect to the equity and, uh, you know, pay equity. Uh, my question is that uh, what the human, uh, the, 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 the Commission on Civil Human Rights has been doing to ensure that the federal rules and regulations already in place have been respected? Sure. So, the, the are most you, uh, it isn't under your jurisdiction to do it. Are you capable of doing it? If yes, what have been done? If not, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So when we um, get, we do receive um, inquiries and complaints around unequal pay. Um, and we have since 2018 received 45 such claims. Um, 
29 of these cases, to answer an earlier question, Chair, were uh, based um, on gender as well. Um, and of these cases, um, we have found probable cause in one. Um, a number have been closed and um, in several cases there was no determination. But I think um, we can talk a little bit about what kind of um, remedies and damages and civil penalties are um, available when we, when we do find uh, discrimination has occurred. So Catherine, I'll turn it back over to you. Of course, thanks, John, and thank you, Chair Jean. So we only have the ability at our agency to enforce the city's human rights law, the city's anti-discrimination law. We do have a work sharing agreement with at least one federal agency, and so we do receive complaints under the federal anti-discrimination laws, but we can't investigate or prosecute them. We can just help preserve people's rights. Uh, but thanks to the council um, and thanks to the work of our agency as well, we do have the most expansive anti-discrimination law in the country, and we're very proud of that. And proud of the work that we do carrying out the mandate you have given us to combat discrimination here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as Joanne was mentioning in this particular area of complaints under salary history, there have been, it looks like 11 cases that have resulted in a positive outcome for the complainant. So a total of $341,000 in damages collected for those victims. And about 16 cases that have been filed in the past three years are more recent and still remain open and under investigation. Uh, we have additional claims that have been filed under the salary history protections of our law as well. Some of them are overlapping with the equal pay complaints and some are, are different. The salary history protections is an area where we've done a lot of testing and some commission initiated work as well to make sure that that area of our law is being enforced. <clears throat> now, our complaint process sometimes starts with a complaint that's filed by a member of the public who believes that they have seen an illegal ad or that they have been paid less than a colleague for a discriminatory reason. And sometimes it starts on a commission initiated basis where a member of the public provides a tip or we get information that there's pay and equity going on. And in those instances, we may reach out to the employer before filing a complaint to see if we can reach a resolution or we may file a complaint as the commission and conduct an investigation. Uh, once the complaint is filed, either by the commission or by a member of the public, we gather further information. So documents, we interview witnesses, we get data about pay um, and other factors, policies. We learn more from people who are working there, what they've experienced, how they're being paid, why they're being paid, what they're being paid. And then ultimately we reach a determination. If our determination finds evidence of discrimination, we seek to settle or conciliate the case. And if we can't do that, then we would prosecute it. Um, and I think as Joanne had mentioned earlier in her opening remarks, there's a really <laughs> wide array of remedies that we seek in conciliation or that our commissioner can order at the end of a prosecution. So that can be money damages for the complainant. If they were paid less, they can get back pay, emotional distress damages, attorney's fees. We as the commission can seek penalties up to $250,000 for violations of the law. And there's a wide range of affirmative relief. So fixing illegal job ads, creating or changing policies, training for HR employees and hiring managers. Um, and then sometimes additional steps as Joanne had referenced, such as partnering with community organizations to create pipelines for hiring to diversify our workforce and ensure that there's access for members of underrepresented groups. <coughs> Thank you very much. When we talk about uh, pay inequity, <clears throat> excuse me, it is a very important topic in New York City and also throughout the nation. It is uh, uh, about the civil and human rights of people who are working hard. But I think that uh, to achieve the goal that we are all looking for, we are all you know, searching, uh, it will take more than uh, the Commission on Civil and Human Rights. It will take more than uh, you know, uh, the employer or the employees. I think all the companies, all of us should be involved in uh, making the effort to make sure we reach uh, what we are looking for, uh, pay equity. But uh, I know that uh, yeah, the commissioner mentioned that uh, the Commission on Civil, uh, Civil and Human Rights uh, reinforcement agency, enforcement agency. But in terms of uh, uh, working together to achieve this goal, novel goal, 
I think that uh, I think the commissioner, the deputy commissioner mentioned that also. The uh, commission of, uh, from civil and human rights is an institution that provides also uh, uh, training and, uh, and services. And I do believe in this case, when we talk about uh, equity or inequity, it would be necessary, it is very important that we communicate to the employees and also to the employers and also educate them, you know, let them understand, let them have them understand the need and the necessity for all of us to reach this uh, equity uh, pay that we are looking for. That's me providing the training and also workshop to the employers. And at the same time, providing also uh, training and, and workshop to the employees also. And other for both of them to understand the need and the necessity, the urgency to uh, reach this uh, equity pay that we are talking about. Could you tell us uh, what has been done in this, uh, you know, in this direction? What has been done in terms of reaching out with the employees, providing training to them, and reaching out also to the employees, and providing also training to them? Sure. So I think um, we are a law, law enforcement agency, but as I mentioned, um, we are also an agency that believes in preventing discrimination before it occurs. And that's why almost half of our agencies is committed to education and outreach. So anytime we uh, make a substantive amendment to the law, we are thinking about how do we educate the public. And to your point, Chair, that means individual rights holders, in this case, people who will be applying for jobs, uh, as well as employers, right? So we work um, broadly with all relevant stakeholders. We spend both um, Special Commissioner Greenberg and I um, develop with our team public facing materials, FAQs, fact sheets about our law, which sit on our website. But we also go into communities through our five community relations bureaus to ensure that people understand um, their, their rights and obligations where that is, um, that is important. And we do trainings constantly with community partners. Um, and in fiscal year 21, for example, we reached more than 100,000 New Yorkers through these trainings. So we take really seriously the, the piece about education and, and prevention. Um, and we also, like anybody these days, use our social media channels to push out amendments to the law and, um, and invite everyone to, to um, check us out if you have time. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, we all know, and I say that, I mentioned that several times, that New York City is home to so many people, immigrant people coming from all over the place. And the immigrant people, they are, I believe they are very affected by that also because the fact they are immigrants, they come to a system, they don't understand too much. And also uh, uh, they are very easy, uh, easy uh, target also. So uh, when you have been trying to provide training, workshop and uh, education to the employers and employees and uh, did you use also people who speak different languages? Because we have so many people speaking so many languages in New York City. How did, what did it do to reach out also the immigrants, the people who just came? They are legally, I'm talking about the people who are working hard us, but they don't get you know, integrated to the system yet. They don't know, there are a lot of things they don't know. What did you do? What is the effort that, that has been done to reach out to them, to make sure that they're educated and also they are informed about this situation. Okay, I was muted, um, uh, but uh, very, you, very did happy. You, did you hear me? Yes, very happy to answer this, this question. I mean, first I'm proud to say that staff on the commission speak over 30 languages. So that is quite important for our ability to be able to share information with individuals in New York, no matter what um, language they are most comfortable speaking. We also have on our staff liaisons to particular community groups and work very closely in the rollout of information about um, substantive changes to our law 
with community groups that are well embedded um, and often have stronger relationships with communities, whether they've been historically in New York um, or are more newly arrived in, in New York City. Um, we also endeavor to translate um, our major documents into as many languages as, as possible. And so um, they are accessible if people read another language. We have recently rolled out um, videos um, in Mixteca and other um, indigenous uh, people's languages so that um, we are reaching um, all the New Yorkers that, that we can. Um, and as that changes, we shift as well. Thank you very much, sir. You know, this legislation is going to require the employers to, uh, to force also the minimum and the maximum of pay. Hello? Yes. Uh, what, uh, how would this legislation impact employees and employers in New York City? Can you tell us how, you know, this legislation will impact the employees and the employers in New York City if it get enacted. Sure, and I think uh, the I, I think my colleague Catherine spoke to this. Um, it requires employers to post a minimum and maximum salary, um, which in many min many instances employers are working with a budget. They know um, what what the ranges are, um, and um, can post them with other job requirements. And um, it, it we think it promotes both transparency, right, by providing information to potential employees to determine if they're gonna apply for a job and if they are applying for a job, um, gives them tools to negotiate with. Um, it also can help promote more general accountability because people understand the wages that are available across sectors um, and that includes all New Yorkers, whether or not you're applying um, for the job. And also, can you tell us how will this impact employment? in New York City. Would there be any change in the behavior and the, you know, the, the, the employment situation in New York City? Um, I think that the, the private sector, right? That's the, the question, is that? Yeah. Um, yes, the hope is that it will change. That's not to say there aren't employers who already post this information, but I think the more that this information sees uh, the light of day, the more thoughtful people have to be about how they are engaging um, in um, putting their jobs out in the world, talking about them and developing pay scales for different positions. So I think the, the hope is that it will lead to a, a positive change in behavior that gets to the, I think, multifaceted and multi-pronged challenges that we're talking about this morning. Uh, we know every time that we are trying to implement something, there's always a cost. It's never free. <laughs> so uh, I think there would be a cost also uh, to include the minimum and maximum salaries in the job listing. Do you have an expectation of the cost of this uh, change or the, to implement it? Uh, in, in my view, as I, as I was saying, I think it's not requiring creation of a new document or new tools, but rather just asking for more information to be put on the job postings that are already out there. So there may be costs, but I would imagine them to be uh, minimal to the extent we're talking about the, the postings. Uh, some, I, I, I don't know if I remember clearly, you mentioned also it is very difficult to deal with uh, pay inequity in New York City. You say something like this, it's very difficult to handle that. But if the law get uh, enacted, are you going to reinforce it? What are you going to do? Are you going to be able to make sure that, you know, uh, the, 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 the law accomplish what we are looking for? Because it seems that you mentioned that it's a very difficult uh, uh, topic or subject or situation. What is it? What, so what, what do you think? Um, we, we will start with the education prong that we've already discussed, right? Part, part of um, ensuring rights are fulfilled is making sure that individuals know what their rights are. So that is a keen first, first step. 
Um, as my colleague Catherine Greenberg already mentioned, we rely um, fairly extensively on our relationships with sister agencies as well um, as with community groups to understand when either the law is being violated or where there's the potential for violations and, and to step in again through our trainings and outreach. We receive inquiries through our, um, our info line and where we think there's the possibility that discrimination occurred either because we received an inquiry or um, through testing, which is something else that we, we mentioned we can do, right? You can look at job postings and identify if there's compliance, um, then we would potentially either engage in a pre-complaint um, uh, investigation or possibly um, file a complaint as well. And Catherine, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that answer. Uh, would, you, would you go directly uh, straight to the enforcement and will it be also some time of uh, notification to the employees and some opportunity to, to, to correct the situation? Uh, you are planning to go straight to the reinforcement. Will it be any chance for, chance for the employers to try to correct the situation before you implement it? Yeah, so when we say enforcement, I think um, I think that means a lot of different things. It can mean a complaint, but we also have pre-complaint initiatives to, to attempt to cure um, possible violations, and I'll let Kathy speak to that a little bit more. Of course, and thank you for the question. Yes, even our enforcement arm has a lot of different strategies to make sure that there's compliance with the law, and not all of them involve punitive steps. One of the primary things our agency does, and this is our policy department, and I think Joanne referenced this earlier, was putting out a lot of informational materials that help to explain the law, how to follow the law, and where to direct questions. So our policy team makes itself available by phone and email to answer compliance questions from the public about how to follow the law and to give specific guidance um, if they're finding that they're running into challenges that we didn't anticipate in explaining how they can comply in our materials. And then even on the enforcement side, once an illegal ad is reported or found, oftentimes when there's that type of violation, the law enforcement bureau will start by sending a letter, what's called a cease and desist letter that advises the business of the law of how to comply, orders them to correct the job posting and to provide proof of their compliance within a given period, say 30 days, to avoid any type of further enforcement action. So particularly with smaller employers and particularly when we're handling a new law that members of the public may only be learning about, there's going to be a lot of work to do education through outreach as opposed to penalties up front. Uh, we know that uh, at this time, there are many people who are working home remotely. A lot of employees there are working remotely. Uh, you know, this legislation would apply to those people who are working from home uh, remotely. Is there any application? Yeah, and I'll let Catherine take, take this one. Thank you, Cherry G. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, thank you, Cherry G. Yes, in, in general, so what we call the territorial jurisdiction of the city human rights law or that question of which workers are covered is something that courts throughout the state of New York have spoken to. And in general, the test is that the law applies if the impact of the discrimination will be felt in New York City. So in general, our agency and courts view the law as applying to people who are discriminated against while working in the city. And so that would include people who are working in the city remotely, people who are performing performing work at an employer's location in the city, people who work on the road, so say they're salespeople and their regular work takes them into New York City to perform work, they would all generally have the protections of the whole city human rights law, including this provision. Uh, now, at this time, let me turn it to the, uh, to the committee council. I don't know if um, there are colleagues who would like to ask questions. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Eugene. I will now call on other council members to ask their questions in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. You you. Would like, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, raise it now. 
please begin to, um, your questions once I have called on you. And uh, panelists, please remember to keep yourself unmuted so you are able to answer the council member's question. Uh, council member Rosenthal. Great, thank you so much. Um, and again, apologies. Uh, you may see my phone uh, screen flip a few times to my screensaver as I'm um, uh, uh, only working on a single device right now. Um, but first, I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the ASL interpreters who are here. Um, thank you so much for your hard work. Um, and then for the Commission on Human Rights, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, it's just so interesting to learn about what's happening around. Um, I guess my first question is, um, do you have any suggestions, and perhaps this will be in your longer testimony, but the bill is very short, very simple. Do you have any uh, immediate suggestions for um, ways to improve the bill? And my second question is, what will be the biggest challenge that you foresee in implementing the bill? Sure, that, that's a, a really welcome question. I think one thing that, um, that we have been talking about is, um, is when you're requiring a range, is there a way to possibly um, have a, a reasonableness element of it so that there is, is not the potential of a range that is kind of so large that, that um, it would, um, oh, right. not serve the purpose of educating uh, and a potential applicant on, on what actually to expect or, or where this might go. So that that is one thing um, that, that we would um, love to talk to you further about. As yeah, well. and can I jump right in about that? Perhaps the way to do it, because I think what you're referring to is what if there are bonuses or stock options? you know, there's sort of a base salary and then additional things that companies can add on. Um, and so, yeah, those are, those are great points. Um, and I don't know how, quite how we capture all that. But yeah, I look forward to working with you on that point, how to keep it, um, yeah, realistic. Thank you. Keep going. I'm sorry I interrupted. I just totally agree with you. No, no, that's that's right. And I was even talking about a simpler example of say you post that you're hiring for a sales manager and the job description is five, you know, the salary range is five dollars to a hundred thousand dollars, right? Like something Oof. that that's even would fit within the law as it's drafted now, um, but but um, would not necessarily kind of help to change the, the knowledge and power dynamics in the negotiation or the, the job description. And on the, I mean, on the other question, what do we see as the, the biggest challenge? I think it's, it's goes to the heart of what we're talking about. This is a huge challenge that comes out of years and decades of both implicit and explicit bias. And so, um, I think this is a really important piece of leveling the pain fields in, um, in individual actions, but there's so many other things that, that need to be done to ensure that there's greater equity in the workplace. So that's what I see as the biggest challenge. Yeah, I agree with that. I was thinking about um, how my situation, I've experienced a pay inequity situation when I started working for the city, actually, 30 years ago, and discovered when talking to a male colleague who had the same job title that I had, that his salary was about $5,000 higher than mine. And I looked at him and said, what, you know, what, uh, what? And he said, yeah, I told them I have a family. I'm going to need more money. Um, so even within the pay range, um, you know, sometimes, uh, and, and in my mind's eye, that gets to your education efforts. Um, I loved hearing about 
the work you do throughout the city to help people learn how to negotiate um, for a better salary, you know, I mean, I was lucky enough. Well, first of all, I don't think you guys existed, but I was lucky enough to be able to just go talk to the human, um, the HR division and say to them, you know, that's ridiculous. And they changed my salary and they gave me the back pay to the start. But I think my story is pretty unusual in terms of rectifying the situation. Okay. So that's super helpful. Um, I'm going to flip my screen. So, um, but but I need but it's so I can ask you the next question. Apologies. Um, I want to talk for a second about a state bill um, that similarly um, talks about mandating pay ranges to be posted. Um, I think our bill will provide an important local mechanism to report non-compliance. I'm wondering what you think about that. And I'm wondering what you think about um, the location of this bill in the civil rights law. Um, you know, that that be critical or do you think the administration would suggest that we do it somewhere? someplace else? Um, so I'll take the second question first. I think we're still reviewing internally and with law, the kind of the exact terminology um, and, um, and the provisions, but we think it makes sense given our employment jurisdiction um, that this would be a, a part and parcel of what is um, within the, the commission's jurisdiction and what we're looking at okay. as we're addressing um, many types of discrimination which often are impacting individuals at, at the same time. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Catherine to, um, to talk about um, the, the state law piece um, if we have that information, otherwise we'll get back to you about that separately. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, yes, just to say, I think that that it belongs in this section of the code in Title VIII, the New York City Human Rights Law. It really complements, I think, the salary history protections and the pay equity protections that exist. And I think would allow us to speak with even more volume about what employers can and should do to ensure that there's pay equity among their, their workforce. I'm not personally familiar with the pending state bill, so I can't speak to specific distinctions between the bill that you have proposed and between that pending bill. But I can say that there are many areas of overlapping jurisdiction between the city's human rights law, the state human rights law, and the anti-discrimination protections that exist on the federal level. And and for each one of those overlaps, it's simply one more opportunity for government to get involved in eradicating discrimination. So I, I, would, I would say that we support this protection, even if it exists on another level, because that just enables us to further amplify and work to help uh, combat this type of discrimination. That's so helpful to hear. I appreciate that. And I guess the one challenge I really heard today was figuring out how to word the bill such that um, we don't have a ridiculous pay range, um, you know, from $5 to $100. Um, and do you think that that challenge is overcomable? Um, yes. Um, I, I, th I think it, it, it definitely takes a little bit more thinking, but I think we can um, workshop some some solutions that, that we think are, are workable and um, there's our other jurisdictions that have similar um, protections in place and so can look to other areas for guidance as well. Thank you. I ask these questions because these are some of the questions I've gotten. And I just want to make sure hearing from you that um, we're, we're on the right track. I think that's it for me. Um, I mean, one of the other, I'm, so I'm going to ask this question, but it's um, just that um, it just sounds to me the numbers that you were giving for how many cases that you've dealt with having to do with pay discrimination and the fact that if I heard you right, just one uh, was settled 
uh, in, in favor of the, the person who brought it uh, forward, you know, really gives, gives me more, um, you know, uh, interest in moving forward with this bill. Do um, you think that's a fair statement? Yeah, I think so. There were there were um, several cases that went to mediation. So just to to correct on the numbers, there was not just not one that, that was resolved. Um, but I think I mean part of what we were saying is that the the one of, there's a lot of concern about bringing claims, um, and and it's very difficult for individuals to necessarily have the information to be able to substantiate a claim because of some of the taboo around salary history and pay that we're, we're talking about. Um, and so I, I, I do think um, it, it, it provides a really important platform and step to addressing some of these structural um, issues. Great, thank you so much for that. Chair, I'm gonna send it back to you um, with the understanding that you'll be asking the mayor's office of people with disabilities separate and apart from this bill line of questioning. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, next we have Council Member Barron. Uh, thank you very much. I will be very brief. The testimony of this panel basically talks about the, um, the bill was, I think it's 2020 and the other bill presented by Council Member Rosenthal. And first I'd like to ask, I'd ask to be added to both those bills. I think that they're very significant and important. I also want to thank Council Member Rosenthal for her kind words about me and ditto back to you. Uh, I wanna ask you about my two resos, 10, 1039A and 1040. Uh, Council Member Rosenthal said that she discovered that there was a pay disparity between the work that she was doing and someone in the same title. And it was addressed by raising her to the appropriate level and going back to her start date so that she received some type of reparations for the injustice that she suffered. What is the administration's position? What is the commission's position on Resos 1039 and 1040, which call for, which call for a study of what the remedies for the impact of slavery might be for our city? Oh, did you hear me? Yes, sorry. There's a delay in my oh, okay. ability to unmute myself. No problem. Um, so I, I cannot speak for the administration um, uh, on on these resolutions, but I can say, from um, from the commission perspective, um, we support initiatives that aim to address both current and historic barriers to discrimination. Um, we per also are very big proponents of participatory decision making. So um, as was stated earlier, um, the idea that um, any panel put in place would involve um, community members and be a joint, um, a, a, a joint endeavor. Um, and further, we support initiatives that advance dignity, equality, and an adequate standard of living for all, all New Yorkers. So to the extent um, we can support the intent of any measures in that arena, um, we, would, we would do so. Um, and the commission, I'll just flag, has done a, a fair amount of work um, in the arena of anti-Black racism racism specifically, and I'd be happy to share um, the reports that we have created in, in this arena um, and, and to talk further um, offline about these um, resolutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate the fact uh, that Council Member Rosenthal is implementing what she wants us to do by having signers here. And I hope somebody can put in the chat, well, we don't have a chat, but someone can Give me information about where I can go to learn sign language. I've been trying, no, I've been saying 
for more than 25 years, I'm going to learn sign language. And I did go online and try to learn some of the songs to sign them, but it didn't work. But anyone who wants to share any information about resources, about where I can go to learn sign language, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're very welcome, Council Member Brown. And thank you so much also for your legislations and for your advocacy for a long time. And I know Council Member Bowen at that time has been fighting for that also. I didn't want to speak about that yet because I thought that you know we would have the opportunity after. But let me say that uh, for a long time, long time, African descent people, black people have been fighting for reparation and remediation and remedies for what they have been suffering, what the black people have been suffering, you know, since uh, for millions, uh, you know, from, uh, from uh, many hundreds of years. And also the contribution of uh, black people, there is no words to express and to explain people, the contribution of the black people to the United States of America. I think this is something remarkable, important, not only for the black people, but also for all Americans. We have to know history, what America is about. How America become America? Who have contributed? The, 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 the challenges, the struggle, different people went through. Not only black people, but everybody, but especially black people have been through so much to contribute to the United States of America. But many people don't, don't know that. And then this is about time to, this is a justice, this is education, this is fairness, this is talking about the history of the United States of America. And the commission and those two legislation, they are very, very important, and I hope that they will pass the city council overwhelmingly. Thank you very much again for our advocacy and for those legislation. And thank you also to uh, council, former council member Bowen, and actually assembly member, and soon council member Bowen again. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you. Now I turn it back to the uh, legislation, to the consent, to the committee consent. Thank you, Chair Eugene. We will now turn to public testimony. Uh, I'd before like that, can I, can I ask only one more question? Of course. Uh, uh, Council Member Rosenthal, I want to thank Council Member Rosenthal also for those two legislation, very important legislations that um, uh, address issues that many, many, many New Yorkers are facing. Number one, for the pay inequity and also for the, the people who need uh, the opportunity to enjoy you know, uh, opportunities that many of us, all of us in New York City, were enjoying. I'm talking about uh, the, uh, the uh, deaf people who cannot hear properly. So uh, I want also to piggyback to what uh, Council Member was uh, shared with us. She discovered that, uh, you know, a pay disparity. And uh, this is, uh, th that can remind us exactly how important our information. When people are informed, when people have the knowledge, what can they do to implement their life, to, 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 to implement their life? what the difference would be. Because she had the information, she had the knowledge, she could go and ask for reparation to ask also for, for uh, a payment or, or salaries to be changed. So my question to the uh, commissioner, I know that uh, my father always said that my son, there is no perfection in nothing. There's always room for improvement. And the commissioner mentioned that um, uh, the Commission of Civil and Human Rights has been doing, has, has been providing training and also workshop to people. That's great. But because we know there's no perfection in anything, is there also something you believe that you can do in addition that to what you have been doing to provide to the workers the information and the opportunity to, to have the knowledge to do what Council Member Rosenthal did in terms of you know, going, having the information and the knowledge, and the courage also to go and to say, you know what, I want you know, to be paid equally, and I want the, the pay equity, and I want to 
get the salary that I deserve. Is there anything that uh, the Commission of Civil and Human Rights can do to make sure that people are informed, they got the knowledge, the education to take position and also to demand for the, you know, the, the salaries that they deserve? Yeah, I mean, as, as part of what I mentioned, where we have um, the, the opportunity and, um, and the partnership of sister agencies like the Commission on Gender Equity and um, the Department of Consumer and Workplace Protections, I think we've been quite effective in going into communities and hearing from individuals and having an exchange that's not necessarily a workshop or a training, but where we're hearing experiences and thinking about how does our law respond? How do other agencies in New York provide services that help, um, help to meet people's needs? And again, working with, um, with, with council uh, and uh, others in the administration to think about gaps in protections and what's needed um, to, to address them. Um, but we are always also taking recommendations for how, how to be improving our outreach and education. So we'd be open to hearing from others after the hearing as well. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And thank you to all your staff. Thank you for what you're doing for New Yorkers. Thank you so very much. We are all in this together. Let's keep on going and keep doing the right thing. Thank you so much. Now I want to turn it back to uh, the community council. Thank you, Chair Eugene. I see we do have a question. Council Member Rosenthal has her hand raised, so we can go to you. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Ganapti. I appreciate you. Um, you know, I think um, I just want to make sort of a, another point about um, what Chair Eugene is talking about, and then I'd actually like, I'm hoping that the Deputy Commissioner from, or the Director from um, MOPD is still available for questions. I have a question for him. Um, but I think, um, you know, um, and, and Council Member Barron can speak to this more eloquently than I can. But, you know, the question in my situation is answered a lot by the privilege that I had growing up, right? And, you know, it was taught if I don't like the situation, I go and try to fix it. And in the history of um, Black people in this country uh, does not uh, land, um, does not leave Black people in the same situation as I had. Um, which is why this is um, this whole, why the Black Lives Movement um, is so incredibly important that we need to make sure everyone is empowered to make sure that, that their rights are, are heard and respected. Um, so, so there are a lot of important things that come out of um, this particular, my particular situation. Um, and Council Member Barron, I don't know if you wanna say something about that. I am just gonna jump over to the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities. I have um, just a question for you um, on the open caption bill. Um, I guess two questions. One is about enforcement and whether or not, um, you know, MOPD believes they will have a good role in enforcement and whether or not, sorry for these alphabet soup, but um, DCWP, the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections, whether or not they will be able to enforce the bill. Um, and secondly, um, I really was so heartened um, by your testimony to hear the support from the administration. I'm curious in the administration's research, have you found any drawbacks to open captions. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm sorry, we're just switching interpreters. So just give us one of second, course. please. Thank you. No problem at all. And thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Only one of us has the work. ability to it's unmute. High. That's it. <laughs> um, what are you trying to... Tony's just looking for me. Hi. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. It was frozen. No worries. My end. I'm having technical difficulties, Tony's saying. So uh, in relation to your first question with enforcement and DWP, DCWP, I'm sorry. I just want to mention very quickly that, you know, we fully support this policy and we want to make greater accessibility and equality for our public spaces, including our theaters. And, you know, as a designated enforcement agency, I don't foresee any issues with enforcement. Do you have any specific concerns regarding the impact of the bill and its enforcement? Um, you know, we can definitely discuss that with the sister agency. Sorry, there, uh, um, no, I was wanting to get a sense of, uh, you answered the question perfectly. Okay. Um, and the second question, uh, my computer was freezing a little bit, so would you mind repeating the second one? Not at all. Um, I'm, I, what I, said was that I am so heartened to know how much support the administration has for open captions at movie theaters. But I am curious in your research, have you found any drawbacks to open captions? Me as a deaf person, no. And in the research as well, I have not found any drawbacks and I don't foresee that happening because it's really about accessibility for all. And like I said, it's not only the deaf and hard and hard of hearing community, it can be various different people. So no, I don't foresee any drawbacks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ms. Ganapathy. Send it back to you. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, Chair Eugene, do you have any additional questions? No, not at all. Thank you so very much. And one more time, thank you to all the, uh, the, the speakers and the commissioner and all the staff from the uh, Commission on Civil and Human Rights Committee. Thank you for your job. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like, to, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting up the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would like to now welcome Roger Wareham to testify after Roger Wareham, we will be calling on Leah Goodridge and then Julia L. Male Sachs to testify. Roger Wareham, you can go ahead. Good, Good time, we'll begin. 
to the Committee on Civil and Human Rights, Chair Pearson Eugene, Council Member Barron, good morning. My name is Roger Wareham. I'm here today to speak in support of proposed resolutions 1039A and 1040. By way of background, I'm a human rights attorney and a member of the December 12th Movement, which is a non-governmental organization that defends the rights of people of African descent in New York City, the United States, and throughout the global African diaspora. I'm also the International Secretary General of the International Association Against Torture, which, like the December 12th Movement, is an NGO in consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council. In this capacity, I have been a regular participant in the UN's human rights bodies in Geneva, Switzerland since 1989. In terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, for over 30 years, we've been actively involved locally, nationally, and internationally in the campaign for reparations for people of African descent as a vehicle to begin repairing the damage inflicted by over four centuries of chattel slavery and systemic racism. In 2001, the United Nations World Conference Against Racism, held in Durban, South Africa, declared that the transatlantic slave trade and chattel slavery were crimes against humanity for which reparations are due the descendants of the victims. The state and national legislation which these proposed resolutions support are important steps in advancing that declaration. The COVID pandemic, which still overshadows all New Yorkers, has further exposed the historic and continuing inequities faced by Black people, particularly in the area of healthcare. This is an opportunity for New York City to take a stand in support of the civil and human rights of its citizenry of African descent. The agenda for this meeting asks, in addition to these resolutions, what steps could be taken to address reparations and the continued impacts of slavery? My answer is that the New York City Council should support the campaign that is being waged to have President Biden issue an executive order on reparations. Early on, President Biden stated that he owed his election victory to support from the black community and that he, quote unquote, had our back. We propose that he implement that promise by issuing an executive order that would include a $50 billion down payment on reparations targeted to provision of state of the art healthcare facilities in black communities. I end with the words that we developed for the UN World Conference Against Racism. They stole us, they sold us, they owe us reparations now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rogers. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now turn to questions from council members. Uh, I see council member Barron has her hand raised. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the committee council. I just want to uh, acknowledge the work that attorney Roger Wareham has done for as long as I've known him, which is about 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I want to acknowledge the commitment that he has the broad breadth of knowledge that he has about, particularly also international issues, their involvement in the UN as a non-GO and the impact that they have had in bringing awareness and educating people, general citizens, as well as those who are in the particular advocacy groups of the plight that we face and organizing and mobilizing people to respond. I just wanted to acknowledge his presence, thank him for his testimony and commend him for his work. Thank you, and I would just add, in terms of the, the comment that the chairman, uh, Eugene, made around the importance of history, that the resolutions that are being put forward, that the resolutions that are being put forward and the legislation they're talking about are very important because the role of African people in the, in the United States is not simply black history, it is United States history, and that's under underreported. And I think also in that context, the role that Haiti played in terms of yes. uh, the, the, the struggle of Black people inside the Americas, particularly inside of North America, is, is really not always understood. And the punishment that Haiti suffered because of that to this day um, mm -hmm. is a result of that. And so when we talk about reparations, you're really talking about reparations for uh, 
you know, what's what's happened throughout the Americas, particularly in, in terms of Haiti. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Ware. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Ware. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I appreciate your, your, your presentation and your comment and your knowledge also of history and the knowledge of our council member Brown also. I think the history of Black people should be told. And we have to do a lot of effort to make sure that people know exactly the reality, the truth about the Black people, their contribution and uh, their sacrifices for the United States. Thank you so very much. Thank and you. Again, thank you for your testimony and Council Member Brown. Thank you very much for those two important uh, resolutions. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member uh, Chair Eugene. We will uh, now turn to testimony from Leah Goodrich. After Leah Goodridge, we will have uh, Julia Elmale Sachs and Seher Kwaja. Uh, Leah Goodridge, you may proceed after the sergeant's call time. Thank you. Can I uh, record my testimony? Yeah. Your time will be. He says, please ask the host to give you permission to record. Sorry, give us one minute. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Leah Goodridge and I am the Managing Attorney for Housing Policy at Mobilization for Justice. And thank you for hearing my testimony today on intro 1039, 2019 and 1040. We are in full support of both measures to establish a commission on reparations to examine the impact of slavery in New York. Sorry, just one, uh, this, to be honest, the testimony is a bit hard for me. Um, I did pray before, give me the strength of my ancestors for this testimony, but, so I want to talk about a place that many New Yorkers know, Central Park. Central Park is a beautiful, serene space that many go to for its sprawling views, but beneath it lies a somber history of how it was built. So in 1825, Black families took root in and built homes on a land strip, calling it Seneca Village. It was a thriving community and one that could have produced generational wealth through property ownership. But it didn't turn out that way. In 1853, the New York legislature passed a law to set aside land for New York's first major public park. The city wanted Seneca Village torn down for that park. The residents resisted, the city won, about 1,600 Black Americans were displaced, evicted, the name of the park, Central Park. In many ways, Central Park and its history is symbolic of New York and its connection to the slavery of people of African descent. New York is a progressive state, yet it too has a dark history on how it was built. And the ghosts of slavery are everywhere. Wall Street, built by enslaved people. Duane Street, hidden ne Negro burial ground built in the 1700s, bodies of 419 Black people. Some historians estimate there to be as many as 20,000 bodies. City Hall in 1741, 10 fires burned in New York. Some white New Yorkers feared this to be a slave uprising. In turn, 13 Black men were burned at the stake, 17 Black people hanged, and more than 100 thrown in a dungeon, right there at City Hall. As I mentioned, I'm a housing attorney, housing rights, and one of the most profound effects of slavery in New York today is that the very people who built this city are the ones who were being pushed out of it. Eviction rates between 2009, 2017 and 2019, tenants living in majority black zip codes were more than three times as likely to be evicted as tenants living in majority white zip codes. Redlining can't even get a loan to buy a house in the land your ancestors built. Deep theft. The list goes on. Reparations are long due to correct these wrongs, but it needs to be done right. For that to happen, we need a commission of qualified people who can study and research the impact of slavery. And I'm, I'm in full support of that. Thank you for, your, for hearing my testimony. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank 
you. Uh, I see we have Council Member Barron's hand is raised. Uh, Council Member. Yes. yes, thank you so much. I just want to thank the panelists, Attorney Goodrich, for the presentation that she gave a very succinct but very powerful uh, tidbit of the impact of what African Americans did and what they were subjected to and what they were lo what they lost in the building of the city. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Thank you. I would now like to welcome uh, Julia Amali Sachs to testify. After Julia Amali Sachs, we will have and Beverly Newfield. Uh, Julia, you can go ahead once the sergeant's call time. Oh. Good time will be. Good afternoon, Chair Eugene and Council Members Rosenthal and Barron. My name is Julia Amali Sachs, and I'm a plaintiff side employment attorney at Cromiller PC. I'm here to testify today on behalf of Neela New York, the New York affiliate of the National Employment Lawyers Association, working with Powher, New York. As employees attorneys, we regularly represent employees who are subjected to discriminatory treatment and practices at work. Most of our clients are women and people of color who seek to remedy unlawful conduct they have been subjected to by their supervisors and company executives. Such unlawful or discriminatory treatment sometimes includes pay disparities for the same or substantially similar roles and responsibilities. As an example, one of my former clients learned that she was making significantly less than her male counterparts only by happenstance when she came across an Excel spreadsheet in the course of regular business that contained salary information for all employees. Prior to that, she had no idea she was being underpaid. Had the employer posted the salary range of her role at the outset, she could have negotiated a fair compensation and the company could have avoided a long drawn out and costly lawsuit. Salary range information would be immensely useful to employees in other ways as well. Say an employee asks for a raise after they've taken on extra responsibility and is told that a raise is simply not possible because they're already at the top of their salary band. That employee may simply leave the company. Alternatively, she might stay and be paid less than some of her male peers at her detriment. If employees have access to salary range information from the start of their employment, they can make informed decisions when accepting a position or applying for a promotion. By intentionally keeping employees in the dark about salary range information, employers have unfair leverage over their employees and can, and often do, more easily pay certain disfavored employees less than they deserve. The point of this bill is to create much needed transparency around an often taboo topic. Similar to the state wage notification law, where employees are made aware of their hourly and overtime rates, this bill would simply endow employees with earning potential information. Neela in New York and Powher previously supported the New York City salary history ban, which became effective in 2017, and which mandated that New York City employers cannot ask about an applicant's salary history during the hiring process. Like the salary history ban, this bill would help employees advocate for themselves based on their merits and qualifications, and it will help employers retain talent and avoid unnecessary litigation down the line. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now call on Sahara Kwaja to testify. After Sahara Kwaja, we will have Beverly Newfield and Kat Shugrudo Santos. Uh, Sahara, you can go ahead once the sergeant's call time. Your time will begin. Good morning, Chair Eugene and members of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. My name is Sahar Kwaja, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a senior attorney at Legal Momentum, the Women's Legal Defense and Education Fund. For over five decades, Legal Momentum has been at the forefront of using the law to advance gender equality, including pay equity. And we applaud the council for its pioneering work in this area. The purpose of my testimony today is to shed light on the critical role that pay disclosure laws play in advancing pay equity, particularly for women, people of color, and other vulnerable workers. 
Today, women of color and women in low-wage work continue to face the most sizable and stagnant pay disparities. And under our existing laws, these women bear the burden and risk of identifying, challenging, and correcting gender-based pay discrimination alone and in the dark. Despite the passage of groundbreaking federal legislation and state and local legislation on equal pay, pay secrecy continues to undermine the efficacy of these laws. The prevalence of pay secrecy prevents employees from identifying disparities and allows employers to endorse pay equity in theory without having to implement it in practice. To address these long-standing barriers, Legal Momentum has been advocating for laws at the local, state, and federal level that mandate pay rate disclosure upfront when positions are posted. These laws serve various critical functions. They standardize salary settings, eliminate opportunities for employers to inject overt and implicit biases when making salary decisions, which research shows that employers do. They curtail exploitative wage practices, which thrive when we don't know what employers pay their workers and which disproportionately impact women who are overrepresented in low wage work. They breathe life into our existing equal pay laws by giving workers information to identify potential pay disparities and by allowing employers to avoid those disparities by setting pay in advance based on objective factors rather than subjective assessments. They create efficiencies for employers, helping them establish more streamlined and fair pay practices to avoid problematic pay disparities and potential liability. They help level the playing fields for workers, giving women and people of color more leverage in the hiring process since research shows these workers are in a better position when they have information regarding compensation. A strong pay disclosure law should do several things. It should mandate disclosure of pay ranges to those seeking a job, to applicants, and to existing employees. Mm -hmm. It should require ranges to be reasonable and based on a range that the employer actually relied upon, and this was touched upon by the commission. It should cover broad disclosure of pay, including salary, benefits, and other forms of compensation, and I know um, council member was involved so to that. They should establish a simple, effective, and efficient enforcement mechanism with straightforward penalties for violations to ensure compliance and accountability. They should not require proof of discrimination or discriminatory intent. They should include concrete safeguards against retaliation for anyone asserting their rights under the law. Then they should require public education to ensure that employees and employers are aware of their rights and obligations under the law to facilitate compliance. And the Commission spoke to that. As we tackle pay inequity under the shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic, we must recognize that our current culture of pay secrecy is unjust, inequitable, and thus unsustainable. Legal Momentum is happy to serve as a resource, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for our testimony. Thank you. At this time, I would like to welcome Beverly Newfield to testify. After Beverly Newfield, we will have Kat Chugru Dos Santos and Yolanda F. Johnson testifying. Uh, Beverly, you can go ahead when this is all time. Great, thank you. The time will begin. Uh, thank you, Chairman and members of the committee for holding this hearing and special thanks to uh, Council Member Rosenthal for forwarding intro 1208. You've had so many important bills that have improved the lives of women and all people in New York in your uh, esteemed career. Uh, also uh, to council member Barron, the, this has been a fascinating conversation around reparation remedies. And I think it does tie into the conversation we're talking about wage discrimination and the intersectional nature of it. I'm Bev Newfellow, founder and president of Power New York. We are over 100 organizations working together collectively on economic equality for New Yorkers who identify as women. I'm also a member of the New York City Commission on Gender Equity. Power has had a signature project, the Equal Pay Campaign, since 2007. We've been working on this. And you'll hear from members of that campaign. Uh, you've already heard from some. Um, we look for concrete solutions to eradicate gender wage gap. And here in New York City, we are so proud to have passed a salary history ban. It then went on to become a New York state law and has ripple effects across the country. That's how important New York laws are. Local law 18, requiring the data reporting of a race for public sector uh, employees is, is a game changer. And it still has more work to do 
to unroot disparities. We now have a new pay equity uh, cabinet in New York City. So we are making progress. Uh, Power has helped pass laws on a state level to protect workers from retaliation and also a new standard, equal pay for substantially similar work. So what's next? And what's next is this bill. What's next is creating openness, transparency, information sharing. And really what this bill will do is create a culture shift so that people have the information and employers can actually go out and get the very best uh, candidate for their jobs. We're doing this on the New York State level with Senator Ramos and uh, Assemblymember Joyner. I can't emphasize how important this is to the Latinas and the African-American women in New York City who are making so much less than their uh, male non-Hispanic counterparts. 700,000 Latinas and American, African-American women working full time would have brought in $22 billion in the economy in their lifetime. That is a lot of money. And instead, 30% of Latino women, 24% of African women are living in poverty. You have an opportunity to take an action to make a real change on this. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I would like, uh, Chair Eugene, did you have any questions? No. Give on. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would like to now call on Kat Shugru Dos Santos to testify. Uh, after Kat Shugru Dos Santos, we will have Yolanda F. Johnson and Jessica Stender. Kat, go ahead uh, when the sergeant's call. Thank you. Sorry, I was trying to unmute and it didn't want to let me. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you. I'll wait for my time. You may start. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Eugene, Council Members Rosenthal and Barron mm -hmm. and esteemed colleagues. My name is Catherine Chagru Dos Santos, and I am the Deputy Executive Director for Programs at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm also the co-founder and former chair of the New York City Task Force on Domestic Violence and Economic Justice. I'm really honored to be here today with so much really important conversation about uh, pay equity around reparations and so many intersecting issues. ABP works to respond to and prevent violence <clears throat> within and against LGBTQ and HIV affected communities. Uh, we believe and are here to support intro 1208A because salary transparency is the best predictor of pay equity. Even in New York where diversity is part of our city's core identity, in our economy, pay gaps, as many of my fellow panelists have stated, that correlate with gender, race, and ethnicity are the norm, not the exception. Salary secrecy is one tool used by employers to uphold the status quo of gender, race, and ethnicity-based pay differentials. This is especially important in the nonprofit sector, which is predominantly staffed by those who reflect the communities served and supported by nonprofits in this city. Those who hold intersecting identities as people of color, women, immigrants, low-income people, people living with disabilities, and LGBTQ people. Notably, all of these communities face wage disparities due to systemic bias and discrimination. This council knows well the challenges nonprofit organizations face due to funding structures that devalue our work in the best of times and which have become more difficult during the pandemic. As the city's only LGBTQ specific anti-violence organization, the majority of those that we serve and support are queer and trans communities of color who face disproportionate rates of discrimination, unemployment, poverty, and homelessness. ABP's work helps survivors heal from violence, building physical, emotional, and financial safety, health, and wellness. For nonprofits, mission-driven organizations, arts organizations, and human services agencies, salary transparency helps us align our actions with our values when it comes to how much people are paid for their work. Uh, sharing salary information is part of an ongoing process at ABP to work toward equity and justice and compensation. 
ABP believes that knowledge is power, especially when it comes to how you make a living. ABP works from a trauma-informed and anti-oppressive approach internally and externally. We strive to compensate all of our staff fairly and equitably. Over the past five years, we have created, published, and adhered to a salary scale for all levels of positions, included salary information and job postings, and identified and adjusted pay gaps within and among salary bands. Building on this work most recently, we've implemented full salary transparency. Every AVP staff member has access to salary information across the organization. Given that salary transparency is the best predictor of pay equity, we urge the council to pass intro 1208A to move towards pay equity in our city. Time has Thank expired. You. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, I would like to now welcome Yolanda Johnson to testify. After Yolanda Johnson, we, I will be calling on Jessica Stender and Solange Charis to testify. Yolanda, you can go ahead when the sergeants call time. Time will begin. Good afternoon um, to the New York City Committee on Civil and Human Rights, Chair Eugene, Council Members, and Distinguished Guests. I am Yolanda F. Johnson. I am the first Black President of Women in Development in New York in its more than 40-year history, and I'm also the founder of Women of Color and Fundraising and Philanthropy, a New York-based organization that is a global organization. I'm here to speak today about intro 1208A, because of its important and the absolute imperative for salary transparency to be implemented as a top tool for equity in the nonprofit sector. Both of the organizations I lead have job boards, which are the go-to places for women and women of color in the nonprofit sector. Earlier this year, we implemented a policy around salary transparency. It was very interesting because I received quite a bit of pushback from some people from some organizations and recruiters saying, well, my client can't do that because we're underpaying other people too much and we don't want this person to know that. To people putting in random characters to not have to go through with salary transparency. Ultimately, we prevailed. I also in my own career have experienced uh, salary inequity until others came to the floor and helped me to understand the importance of it. If transparency had been present, it would have made a great difference. In the nonprofit sector, we often suffer from a, a sense of guilt because we're trying to get the good work done and therefore we sacrifice our own well-being and our own needs. Many in the nonprofit sector, especially women, actually are just one to two paychecks away from being in the same situation as many of the constituents that they serve. So I say that I understand budgets can be an issue for nonprofit organizations, and in those cases, an overhaul and assessment needs to be done on fundraising practices, strategy, and income stream diversification. Because what we know for sure is that the nonprofit sector, which professes and endeavors to create a more just and equitable society, cannot accomplish this work off the backs of underpaid professionals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now turn to questions from council members. Uh, council member Rosenthal, you may ask your questions. Thank you. Um, again, I apologize for not being able to, um, for being a little distracted, but um, I just really think all of the preceding, um, you know, people speaking about reparations, it's so powerful. And I want to let you all know how much I appreciate your support for my bill on um, minimum maximum salaries. Um, I, I think uh, what's been said is right. Change is hard and a lot of people will push back. Um, Yolanda, what you were just talking about in, in terms of the nonprofit sector, um, I, I think what will happen here, and I, I feel free to jump in, 
but I think it will expose how poorly government pays for this work. Um, and, and that's, you know, my, somebody I've worked on during my tenure in the council is trying to get higher wages in the nonprofit sector. Um, and it's, I actually think that given that the city contracts with nonprofits to do the city's mandated work, um, these nonprofits should not have to go to private donors to make up the difference between what government pays and what people should be paid. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I know there are uh, nonprofits that also do great work that do not get city funding, but I think that's the piece that really jumps out at me that it will um, lay to bear uh, exactly what is happening in the way that you talk about someone being one or two paychecks away from um, homelessness or real despair. If the sergeant can just make sure Yolanda or anyone who's maybe raising their hand physically or um, can talk, I put that question out to any of the panelists, really. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you for this, Member Rosenthal. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, the nonprofit sector, the workers in the nonprofit sector have often been made to feel like that struggle um, that they they can't ask for more, and I think it will lay bare all of the different disparities in, uh, in pay and equity that is present. We know that it's there, but until we can see it in a transparent way and have the conversations that we need to have to get to where things need to be, it's just going to be a cyclical um, situation that's never going to improve. And certainly from governments that engage nonprofits to the nonprofits themselves, everyone has to take responsibility for this and move it forward. Thank you so much. I believe we also have um, responses from Beverly and Kat. We'll get you unmuted. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you, Yolanda, for that uh, a really important and personal um, testimony. I just want to add quickly that. Power has recently set created priorities for this upcoming year. And one of them is to work with the uh, Just Pay campaign, which is exactly what you're talking about, the Human uh, Services Council's campaign. Um, but all in all, this is about you know, fair pay. And the only way we're going to have that is if we uh, have the kind of transparency that council member, your uh, bill will open up. So I think that's a really interesting point that this hopefully will help, you know, the folks who are doing great work and really uh, not getting great pay. So thank you. That's a really, uh, I think that's a, an additional reason for this bill. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that Beverly and Yolanda said. And I just wanted to add, I just wanted, sorry about the noise in my background. Um, I just wanted to, to add that I think um, one of the important parts here, I think that Helen, your your comment raises, Councilmember Rosenthal, is that um, so much of this is about um, implicit bias and things that folks are not aware of, and so trying to make sure um, that uh, transparency is is what helps us move towards more equity because it exposes those things. And so I think it's really essential that we do that. So um, I just want to underscore what uh, Yolanda um, had had mentioned about that. <clears throat> oh, thank you both so much. I appreciate that input. Um, I do like your standard behind you chat. Is that right? Beautiful black standard poodle. That anyway, is my mini okay. poodle, but I couldn't um, hear thank you. you <laughs> yes, she's decided to testify mini. as well. My oh, okay. Thank goodness. We need a little dog humanity always. 
Um, but thank you both. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions for this panel, I would like to invite Jessica Stender to testify, followed by Solange Charis, Karis, um, my apologies. And after Solange, we will have Jerry Bergman testifying. Jessica, you can go ahead when sergeants call time. Your time will begin. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jessica Ramey Stender, and I am Senior Counsel for Workplace Justice and Public Policy at Equal Rights Advocates. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Equal Rights Advocates and Equal Pay Today. ERA is a national nonprofit legal organization dedicated to protecting and expanding economic access for women and girls and people of other marginalized gender identities. The Equal Pay Today campaign is a collaboration of national and state-based legal advocacy, worker justice, and social justice organizations fighting to close the gender wage gap through policy reform, litigation, and education and outreach. As we've heard, the wage gap persists across industries, occupations, and education levels, and exacts a heavy toll not only on women, and particularly women of color, but also on the families they support. One contributor, as we've been discussing, to the wage gap is that pay disparities are often hidden from sight and can be a result of unconscious biases and historical inequities. And therefore, this issue of pay transparency that we've been discussing at length today is critical, and especially so at the outset of the employment process to help prevent gender and race-based pay disparities from developing in the first place. So a key strategy here under this pay transparency umbrella is providing salary ranges. When an employer asks a job applicant what his or her salary or their salary expectations are without providing them information about the pay for a position, women and people of color are harmed. Studies show that women often ask for less when they negotiate than men, even when they're otherwise equally qualified. Fortunately, research also shows that when job applicants are provided with relevant information in negotiations, including salary range, women are more willing to negotiate and more successful in negotiating, and importantly, the gender wage gap narrows. The much narrower wage gap in the public sector, where agencies typically have transparent and public pay structures, evidence is this, that, that greater salary range transparency helps reduce wage disparities. Nationally, the gender-based wage gap for all full-time workers is 18%, but in the federal government, where pay rates are publicly available, the gender-based pay gap in, in 2017 was just 7%. Likewise, secrecy about pay hides and perpetuates gender pay gaps for existing employees. So when employees have access to salary range information, so not just applicants, but employees about a given position, they can then evaluate whether they're being paid fairly and attempt to resolve any pay disparities that they think might exist with their employer. Uh, thus far, Maryland, Colorado, Washington, California, and Connecticut have all enacted salary range transparency requirements. Other states are looking to potentially do this as well. And I just want to finally note that salary range requirements are also beneficial to employers. Providing job applicants with the range for a position can help an employer more efficiently and accurately match with candidates whose salary requirements are aligned with what they can offer. So employers know the range they're willing to pay, and this just would require them to be transparent about it and also enable them to avoid wasting time interviewing candidates who are not interested in the job, given the pay level that really exists. So in closing, I would just urge the committee to support this important measure to increase pay transparency, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. You. Uh, I would like to now invite Solange Karras to testify. After Solange Karras, we will have Jerry Bergman and then John Taylor. Uh, now, if, if any of the people that will be testifying do require interpretation, please use the raise hand function um, when, I call your, when I've called your name to indicate to us you will need uh, ESL interpretation. Uh, Salon, you can go ahead when the sergeants call time. Your time will begin. Thank you, Chair Eugene and all council members. My Thank name you. is my, my name is Dr. Salon Shara, and I'm a human capital subject matter expert with a PhD in management, an MBA in accounting and finance, and a BA in economics. I have served as the top HR executive for three for-profit organizations, served as a board director for two public companies, and held senior roles at Ernst & Young and Arthur Anderson. I'm currently an adjunct professor in the Masters of Human Capital Management programs at Columbia, USC, and NYU. I'm Distinguished Principal Research Fellow at the Conference Board, and today I'm representing Power New York Equal Pay Committee. I'm here to talk to you about the benefits of human capital transparency for workers, organizations, and the community at large. 
Transparency in all matters human capital, including the matter you are taking up today, is being called for by the most prestigious governance monitoring agencies like the SEC, SASB, the World Economic Forum, the Business Roundtable, and the International Standardization Organization. It is just a matter of time before organizations adopt transparency in all matters, including human capital matters. Several states and municipalities have already passed legislation requiring this kind of transparency that you're discussing today with positive outcomes. Transparency benefits workers. The more information they have, the better they are able to make decisions that ultimately lead to enhanced personal and professional outcomes. The perception that they are being treated in a fair and consistent manner is associated with higher levels of productivity and job satisfaction. This research is based on organizational justice theory. Transparency benefits the organization. Having been studied by the academic community for decades, research proves that there is a positive correlation between human capital transparency and profitability. If I were to tell you that you could improve your bottom line by up to 25% simply by embracing transparency in your business processes, wouldn't you? The argument that disclosing salary information violates trade secrets or compromises a company's competitive advantage is simply no longer true. Scores of company are so transparent, they voluntarily share what was once considered sensitive information and are reaping the benefits and higher engagement, lower attrition and enhanced business outcomes. Competitive salary levels are no longer a secret as the Bureau of Labor Statistics and other organizations like salary.com are widely available. That many organizations voluntarily provide salary ranges for management positions in their job posting proves this point. Lastly, transparency benefits the community at large. An ounce of prevention is certainly worth a pound of cure in this case. Given the war for talent and the shrinking labor pool, we need to make New York City a disclosure forward community and be a leader in the coming transparency movement, drawing businesses and talent to our city. I hope you'll consider these points as you deliberate the merits of this bill. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to welcome Jerry Bergman to testify, followed by John Taylor and then Fred Corman. Again, if anyone on these panels, oh, my apologies, before we start, um, I see that Council Member Roosevelt does have her hand raised. We will. Thank you so much for that, Jisri. Um, and I want to thank the last few panelists for sure for their insights. I really appreciate that. Um, I actually have a quick question for uh, Kat Shrew. Uh, if she's still here and if someone could unmute her. Um, I, your testimony in particular was interesting because you've actually done it at your organization. Um, Hang on one second. Jisri, I'm not able to see all the panelists. Is is Kat still here? And I'll take a look. Okay. I just want to make sure she's able to answer the question. Uh, if she's not, I will ask her separately. But... Um, so if she's not here, it's fine. Uh, what I'll be asking her is what the impact was of her organization instituting the public pay ranges, um, pay ranges, and whether or not they lost any staff or if staff were, what, what the response of staff was. Um, I'm, because she's not on, I'm going to ask her to um, actually try to put that in writing and submit it as part of uh, her additional testimony. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, we'll now move to the next panel, which is um, I'm calling on Jerry Bergman to testify, followed by John Taylor and Fred Corman. Jerry, you can go ahead when the sergeants call time. Thank you. Please don't start me on the timer yet, because I wish the council to understand that when people speak as fast as they have been, the ASL interpreters and the CARP providers 
absolutely cannot keep pace with the speed of the remarks. So I need to speak at a controlled pace. And I would ask that you give me an extra minute or two if that's required to get through my testimony. Thank you, Chairman Eugene, council members and staff. I'm Jerry Bergman, an advocate for people with hearing loss. A, a big thanks to council member Rosenthal for introducing INT 2020. I testify today in support of the ordinance to require open captions, also known as subtitles, on a fair and equitable basis, one that reasonably accommodates us without harming the motion picture exhibitors. We seek to buy tickets to open caption showings for all movies, all cinemas, on a regular weekday, weeknight, weekend, matinee, and evening schedule, a modest one that will not put cinemas out of business. For a decade, deaf and hard of hearing people have been repeatedly and continually denied movie enjoyment by systems that fail, devices that go dead, or that must be painfully held for two hours because they otherwise would topple over. Unlike closed caption devices, captioning is wildly popular among all people and increasingly common in the media. A change.org petition specifically on open caption movies now has over 24,000 signatures, over 1,500 of them from New York State and almost 600 from city folks. Recently, when Marvel's Eternals was released, promoters contacted our Hearing Loss Association and offered an open caption screening for us. Why? only because one of the movie stars, Lauren Ridloff, is deaf. Ms. Ridloff, in a September 19 New York Times interview, was asked if movies are accessible to people who are deaf. Her response, no, we're an afterthought in movie theaters and that needs to change. She described using a CC device as quote, a headache, unquote, because most of the time she said, Often when the movie is half over, the devices don't work. And then you get her words, well, how about I give you a free ticket for the next movie? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Recently, AMC began scheduling some open caption showings. The company's CEO referred to the move as, quote, a real advance for those with hearing difficulties or where English is a second language. Correct about ESL people, but no, not a real advance, simply a start. Try finding an open caption showing at a cinema near you. I did that this week. Although I live within walking distance of two AMC multiplexes, I would need to take public transportation to get to one where an open caption showing was scheduled. I live in Manhattan and can do that, but imagine a person or family with a deaf child in the outer boroughs. Cinemas have a checkout and return policy for using closed captions devices. That is inconvenient, especially when the devices are dispensed in the lobby, but the movie is showing in an auditorium way upstairs. Because some of us feel stigma or embarrassment about the need for visible accessibility being seen using open captions devices makes us feel uncomfortable, wondering what other patrons may think since being deaf or having hearing loss generally cannot be seen. Some restaurants now routinely have QR codes through which to view menus to protect against COVID transmission. We have no clue whether caption devices are even disinfected at all, much less before being transferred from one person to another. None of these issues pertain when people can watch movies on the big screen with open captions. For years, the Deaf Entertainment Access Foundation has politely asked local cinema managers to schedule open caption showings. With rare exception, their requests have been denied. AMC said it will offer open captions in 240 US locations 
I believe that's less than 50% of their cinemas in the US. Why? What about the people who are deaf or hard of hearing elsewhere? I'm submitting a two page fact sheet and nine page backgrounder as written testimony for more detail. I hope if any of you are not convinced that open caption movies are needed, you will read the documents, understand how we got to this point and help us by voting for a revised version of INT 2020 that treats both us and movie exhibitors fairly. In closing, many supporters have pledged to submit written testimony. Many of them have online jobs, doctor's appointments, et cetera. So that's why more of us will not be heard from today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I would like to call on John Taylor to testify. After John Taylor, seeing that Fred Corman is not in the Zoom, I will be calling on Matthew Greller and uh, followed by John, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeants call time. Your time will begin. Hello, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Eugene and council members. Uh, thank you to uh, council member Rosenthal for introducing this legislation. My name is John Taylor and I'm president of the New York City chapter of the Hearing Loss Association of New York of, of America. Like many of our members, because of my profound hearing loss, I cannot enjoy movies without captioning. However, many times when I've gone to movie theaters, captioning devices did not work. Closed caption devices place a substantial burden on theaters who must properly maintain them. Sometimes theaters have neglected to charge devices. Sometimes devices were broken. On other occasions, theater staff had not set the devices correctly. The last time I went to the movies, after offering me three different devices, none of which produced captions, the staff realized that the device was not the problem. The auditorium equipment was not functioning properly. I know that my experiences are not unusual. They are typical. Even when devices work properly, the type that is worn as glasses are heavy and uncomfortable, while the devices that are placed in cup holders never fit properly and fall down easily. In addition, it places a burden on users who must arrive early to get a device and to identify themselves as having hearing loss. Extensive research has demonstrated that captioning benefits everyone, not just those with hearing loss. People comprehend and remember text better when speech is captioned than when it is only spoken. I've submitted a peer reviewed uh, journal article summarizing this research and hope that you will take the time to, to read it. This research confirms what many of us have seen in person when we have attended caption performances on Broadway. Many people who are not wearing hearing devices are glued to the captioning screen. And of course, captioning will benefit millions of people with undiagnosed or untreated hearing loss. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would like to call on Matthew Greller to testify. After Matthew Greller, we will have Alex Rich and <clears throat> Doug Murdoch. Matthew, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeant's call time. Your time will begin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Eugene and members of the committee. My name is Matt Greller, and I'm an attorney and a lobbyist here on behalf of a client, NATO Theater Owners of New York State. In New York City, NATO represents over 30 movie theaters across the five boroughs. Let me be very clear. The movie theaters are still suffering from this terrible pandemic. The theaters want all patrons to feel safe and return to the theaters, which is still the best place to see a movie. Of course, this includes members of the deaf and hard of hearing community. We want members of the deaf and hard of hearing community and others that might benefit from increased open caption showtimes to feel welcome at the cinema. At the same time, however, we oppose intro 2020 for three main reasons, which I describe in further detail in our written testimony. First, this bill will be damaging economically for the movie theaters. Theaters are already trying to recover from being decimated by the pandemic, and experience and data show that audiences that are not deaf and hard of hearing do not like open captioning and neither request refunds or they stay home. 
A recent survey estimated that 49% of the audience that has, uh, has not returned since the pandemic started. We do not need another reason for patrons to stay home, especially with competition from streaming services. Second, this bill is unnecessary. Theaters are already providing open caption showtimes voluntarily and offer additional open caption showtimes upon request. One major circuit is currently running an expanded open caption pilot in three of the busiest theaters in the city. The theaters are also exploring ways to improve the closed captioning experience with new technology to make all patrons feel welcome, comfortable, and included. Theaters can and should, should do better on open captioning, but we do not need a legislative mandate to do so. Third, this bill is impractical. It far exceeds existing demand, and the 50% mandate between peak and non-peak showtimes cannot mathematically be met. Even Dr. Strange using the time stone could not figure out a way to play more open caption showtimes than there actually is time. This bill is too convoluted with its ban on overlapping films, awkward start and end times that don't fit for most two hour films and the excessive 50% mandate. Simply put, intro 2020 is unworkable. Lastly, there's a concern about the timing of this bill. When it was first introduced, theaters were still ordered closed by the governor. At the time, we reached out to all sponsors to see if we could engage with constituents to address concerns. The bill was bad timing when it was introduced then, and respectfully, this hearing is bad timing now. Please allow the advocates and the theaters to continue their productive discussions to find a win-win solution for expanding open captioning. Such a solution will be based on common sense and data and not an inflexible mandate that will only kick the movie theaters when they are down. There should not be a rush on this bill just because it is December. The best way to get things right is to allow stakeholders to achieve a voluntary and dynamic solution and not just a legislative mandate. If this bill is implemented, there may not be movie theaters left to show open caption movies or any movies at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, I would like to call on Alex Rich to testify. Hmm. After Alex Rich, we will, I will be calling Doug Murdoch and John Waldo to testify. Alex, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeants call time. Your time will begin. Chairman Eugene and members of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Alex Rich, and I work for the National Association of Theater Owners, a trade association representing the exhibition industry. Movie theaters have been deeply impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. In New York City, theaters were required to close for 50 weeks, and when allowed to reopen, faced capacity restrictions that made uh, breaking even, let alone turning a profit, nearly impossible. With theaters closed or operating at reduced capacity, major studios delayed releasing new films or, remove, or moved them to streaming services, which prolonged the economic impact of the shutdown since theaters had no new product to play when they welcomed back moviegoers. Despite zero income um, during this period, theaters continued to face mounting fixed costs, such as taxes, rent, and city inspection fees. For instance, while the city theaters were so closed as per then Governor Cuomo's executive order, um, one company was, uh, had, still had to pay for elevator and escalator inspections, despite having no patrons, at a cost of $92,000. At the same time, the majority of New York City theaters received no financial assistance from the federal, state, or municipal governments. It will be a long road to recovery for the exhibition industry. As Hollywood begins to release new films, audiences are slowly coming back to see blockbusters on the big screen, but the industry is far from the record-breaking years it enjoyed pre-pandemic. For instance, this past Thanksgiving weekend, box office was down 46% compared to the same time frame in 2019. Further, new research shows that 49% of consumers who attended movies pre-pandemic are no longer doing so. While theaters remain confident that most of these consumers will return to their auditoriums, it will continue to take time. Simply put, the exhibition industry is still facing an existential crisis that threatens the job security of theater employees and the businesses that rely on robust moviegoing to remain profitable. Any mandate that will further dampen customers' enthusiasm for the theatrical experience could force theaters in New York City to close permanently. We believe the requirements of this bill will exacerbate the difficult economic conditions facing theaters by suggesting, subjecting them to further financial losses. And this issue is not just about movie theaters. 
Um, according to an Ernst & Young study commissioned by NATO, movie night spending in other businesses in the U.S. amounted to $5 billion in 2019 before the pandemic hit. New York City restaurants, retail stores, and other businesses will continue to suffer without the customers attracted by movie theaters. As an industry, we remain committed to expanding access to all moviegoers. Later, you'll hear about the steps our industry has taken to ensure that to ensure every movie at any time um, has access to the use of captioning devices. You will also hear about voluntary open caption programs being rolled out by companies across the country. I look forward to answering any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I would like to welcome Doug Murdoch to testify. After Doug Mur Murdoch, we will have John Waldo and followed by Kathleen Collins. Uh, for anybody that does need interpretation services, please uh, use the raise hand function when your panel is called so we are aware that you will be needing interpretation. Uh, Doug, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Chairman Eugene and members of the committee. I am Doug Murdoch, Executive Director of Mid-Atlantic NATO, a regional affiliate of the National Association of Theater Owners. I'm here to speak in opposition to IMD 2020, Open Captioning and Motion Picture Theater. While the impact of open captioning and the nature of the proposed bill will be addressed by my other theater colleagues, I would like to comment on the unworkable parameters of the bill. As you know, the bill calls for certain movie theaters to provide open captioning for at least half of the showings of each movie per week. On the surface, that sounds like a simple equation, but not when you try to apply it to the real showtimes in a movie theater. So let's take a look. Typical showtime schedule for a two-hour movie with 15 minutes of previews and a 30-minute intermission. Um, now, the bill does not define what a week would be, but for this example, we're going to use Friday through Thursday. Now, as illustrated in this um, uh, snapshot, and is also what I submitted in my text note, the film would play about five shows per day, giving us 35 shows a week. Now, according to the bill, at least 50% of those 35 would have to play an open caption. That's 18 open captions per week. But then the bill goes further and says that at least half of the open caption showings would have to be played during designated peak movie attendance hours, defined as a motion picture that begins after 5.59 p.m. and finishing before 11.01 p.m. on a Friday, or a showing that begins after 11.59 a.m. and finishing before 11.01 on a Saturday or Sunday. For this example, I highlighted in the article the showtimes would fit into those designated time periods. The problem is there are only seven showtimes, but the bill would require nine. Again, 18 of the 35 would have to play on the caption and at least half of that would be nine. There's simply not enough time in the day to comply. The bill then goes on further to say that at least half of the scheduled showings that are scheduled outside of that peak period shall so start after 5.59 p.m. and finish before 11.01 p.m. on the weeknights. For this example, I have highlighted in blue the show times that would fit into that time period. So half of nine would be five. Time expired. Two, two, but you end up, this simply doesn't work. The math just simply doesn't work. And for that reason, I urge the committee not to approve this bill. I thank you for the time to speak and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I would like to call on John Waldo to testify. After John Waldo, we will have Kathleen Collins, followed by Monica Bartley. 
Again, if any of these panelists do need interpretation services, please use the raise hand function and we will have an interpreter available for you. Uh, John, you can go ahead as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Thank you all for uh, your attention to this important issue. I'm John Waldo, and you may be wondering why a lawyer in Houston, Texas is testifying about this. The answer is that I've been advocating for the interests of people with hearing loss for about 15 years and have been heavily involved in issues surrounding the movies. So I'm fairly familiar with this whole issue, particularly the problems with closed captioning and open captioning. The theater's concern, and it's a legitimate concern, is that economic times are difficult for them. It's also true that open caption movies tend not to be as well attended as non-caption movies. Those two things are a given. But here's the problem. The theaters consistently only look at half of the whole picture. Here's the whole picture. There are people who don't like open captioning. I get that. What do they do? Do they say, oh darn, the seven o'clock showing of this particular movie on this particular day is open caption, therefore I'll never get to see that movie? I don't think so. I think they find another time to see that movie. Or if they really want to go to a movie at seven o'clock on Friday night, they go to another, uh, another different movie. There are also people who would not be at the theater if it were not for open caption movies. And you're hearing a lot about them today. So where are the numbers? How do they balance out? There was an interesting experiment in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago that shed some real light on that. Um, an open captioned ordinance was proposed there. A number of theaters started offering voluntary open captioned movies, and they hired Ernst & Young, the accounting firm, to develop a model to try to predict attendance and see what difference the captioning made. Here's what happened. Ernst & Young said, okay, here's a situation where we have one movie showing with open captions and the same movie showing in the same theater within an hour with non-captioned. How does it work out? Well, indeed, they predicted that there'd be 23 people at each movie, all other things being equal. The open caption movie only drew 18 people. So that's a loss, right? But do those five people and only those five people go to the non-caption movie? No, there were eight additional people at the, uh, I'm sorry, 10 additional people at the non-caption movie. There was a net gain of four people when you had both options available to people. You know, under certain circumstances, it can be a plus that the people who don't want open caption will find someplace else to go. The people who do need it, they now come to the theater. You're not reinventing the wheel here. Hawaii since 2015 has had a statewide statute that requires two open caption showings a week of each movie. Now I know I'm for two sorry. years it was down to one, but now it's back to two. Um, has that closed the th uh, has that caused theaters to close? I've seen no evidence of that. Um, this is something that can work for everybody. What we'd like to do is find a way to start, to find out what the, the real situation is, not look at attendance on a show-by-show -show basis, but look at aggregate attendance. That's the only way we're ever going to be able to figure out what happens to the people who didn't show up that day for the open caption movie. What do they do? Do they go to another movie? Do they go to on an, another day? We only know if we start looking at aggregate data. Um, we want to keep talking to the theater owners, but really something can be done that can be a win-win for everybody, and we really would like to move in that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, John. Next, we will have Kathleen Collins testifying, followed by Monica Bartley <coughs> and Andy Stone. Kathleen, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Uh, thank you for letting me testify before you here today. I am a co-coordinator at Downstate New York ADAPT. Downstate New York ADAPT is a grassroots non-hierarchical community of people with all types of disabilities advocating for the civil rights of people with disabilities. 
We have reviewed Bill INT 2020, and we support requiring of open caption movie screenings. However, we would propose that all movies have open captioning because people with disabilities should be able to attend any movie at any time they want. Now, I know uh, the movie theater owners and operators here are gasping at this moment. And we've heard these similar arguments before with transportation entities, both private and public entities, when we proposed many years ago about 100% access to buses. However, today we have 100% access to buses in New York City, both on the private and public realm. And it didn't bankrupt anybody. And I know maybe in the beginning people were like, oh, these people with wheelchairs, it's gonna take longer for them to get on the bus and things like that. But now New Yorkers have totally embraced it. And everybody in New York, it's just, you know, a fact of life, we have accessible buses. And I submit to you that we should not underestimate New Yorkers. New Yorkers are great people. And I believe that maybe in the beginning, I know they say these surveys and that, but surveys can be slanted. And, you know, and maybe people don't even know what they're saying yes or no to about what open captioning is. But once they experience it, I'm sure people will all, New Yorkers will embrace it. So thank you for listening to me today. And also thank you for making this meeting accessible to everyone. All New York City Council meetings should be accessible under the Americans with Disability Act. It's our civil right, not just this meeting. We believe and we, we, we are interested in everything, just like everybody else here. And we have a right to be at these meetings and be able to hear what's happening at these meetings and to be able to take down the notes too, because that helps someone like me. So, I mean, captioning is not just for the hearing impaired and the deaf, it's for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will now call on Monica Bartley to testify. After Monica Bartley, I will be calling on Andy Stone and then Raymond Smith to testify. Monica, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, my name is Monica Bartley, community outreach organizer at the Center for Independence of the Disabled New York, Sydney. Sydney's goal is to ensure full integration, independence, and equal opportunity for all people with disabilities by removing barriers to the social, economic, cultural, and civic life of the community. Participating in leisure activities is a significant part of daily living as it contributes to the psychological and cognitive well being, physical health, and quality of life. For a long time, deaf and hard of hearing people have experienced limited participation in some activities, one such being watching a movie at the movie theater like other people. If deaf or hard of hearing audiences need to see a movie with open captions, they're either forced to rely on unreliable theater equipment, work with their schedule around a screening, or wait until streaming or physical release. They have to rely on devices for closed captioning. These devices have been criticized for malfunctioning or not being charged by theater staff before use. To get them functioning requires trips to the box office that causes them to miss half of the movie. It is also very inconvenient to use these devices as having to be looking up and down from the device to the screen for the, the duration of the movie. Sydney sees Intra 2020 as a move in the right direction. Recently, AMC, one of the largest movie theater chains, announced it will expand on-screen captioning at 240 locations in the United States, and we expect to see this extended further. This bill calls for motion picture theaters that have more than two screens and provide more than 10 showings per week to provide open captioning for at least half of the showings of each movie per week. The pandemic has opened up new ways of functioning that we did not see possible. There is so much more awareness now to open captioning in various areas, which has benefited many people. So the general public is more receptive of this. Sydney supports this law and seeks that the New York City Council sign Intro 2020 into law. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> I would like to now call on Andy Stone to testify. After Andy Stone, I will be calling Raymond Smith and then Joseph Masher to testify. Andy, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeants call time. Time starts now. I believe you're still muted, Andy. Okay, a bit of a schoolboy error, apologies. Um, so good afternoon, uh, Chairman, uh, Eugene and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Andy Stone and I am the Regional Director uh, for Regal Entertainment. So as you've heard, the impact of COVID meant that movie theatres were one of the last businesses to reopen across New York City. Uh, you can imagine uh, Regal Entertainment has been significantly impacted by the financial losses that were caused. And furthermore, we continue to incur costs during our extended period of closure, uh, which really has compounded the issue. Now, since we've reopened, um, we've not seen admissions return to pre-pandemic levels. And that includes audiences who do and don't have hearing problems. Um, it's audience per se. Now, as a business, there are times where we've even had to curtail our operating hours because of the lack of admissions coming in through our doors. Now, like all businesses, we want to welcome all audiences, including the deaf and hard of hearing back to the community. There's a business, we screen blockbusters through to small independent as well as foreign films with subtitles. So we embrace all elements and all, all markets. Catering for all audiences and rebuilding consumer um, in our business is therefore integral, and we don't want to alienate anybody. Now, we've worked collaboratively with New York City, uh, and we ensure that we've adhered to the COVID operating guidelines and supported Mayor de Blasio's Vax to the Movies campaign. Um, since we've reopened, we've continued to screen our open caption shows, and across New York City, uh, we've screened 318 showtimes. Uh, these showtimes have been uh, for different films on different days and at different times. And as John Waldo alluded to, you know, our average attendee per show was eight. Um, but if you look at the occupancy level for this, these shows, it's as low as 5%, um, which means there's nearly 95% of the seats unsold in that particular auditorium. Now, besides specific open caption shows, uh, we also have what we know, uh, what we sell as watch parties. This facility gives all customers the opportunity to hire a screen, whether it's for a party, group, or special occasion. And again, just like any other audience, this facility will give those who may be deaf or hard of hearing the opportunity to watch a movie in private at a time which suits them. Now, although I don't have specific data, Cinema managers do report back that a significant number of customers who do not have hearing difficulty but attend an open caption film will ask for a refund. Um, and this does contribute to a further financial loss to the business. Time expired. Okay. Um, and finally, I would like also like you to just look at cinemas not as a solace, but instead look at cinemas as a cumulative. As like any other audience making their decision on wanting to go and watch a film, different cinemas will have different open caption times on different days. This means the consumer has a wide choice of where and when he, she will be able to watch their open caption movie. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lodge. Thank you. I would like to now welcome Raymond Smith to testify. After Raymond Smith, I'll be calling Joseph Masher and then Svetlana Koznetsova. Again, if anyone requires interpretation services when I'm calling your panel, please use the raise hand function so we are aware and we can have those services ready for you. Uh, Raymond, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeants call time. Time starts now.
Okay, there we go. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank the chair and the committee for allowing me to testify today. My name is Raymond Smith. I am a consultant with the National Association of Theater Owners. I have been engaged in ensuring and enhancing access to movie theaters for all consumers for about 30 years, and in particular, this issue of captioning has been front and center for a considerable period of time. While we support the intent behind this legislation, we, we do not support uh, the mandate and one size fits all. And we do support continuation of our collaborative efforts and relationship with the deaf and hard of hearing community, which has been going on for years and years. In the 90s, we met with members of the community and were told they wanted more open captured films. We immediately lobbied the film studios successfully to get more product and continue to do so until it uh, actually always continued to do so. But in the mid 2000s, a new personal captioning technology came on the market. So we once again engaged with our partners in the deaf and hard of hearing community and learned that they were very excited about personal captioning and the access it provided, but did not like that particular technology. So the industry went out and found manufacturers that were willing to design and develop these technologies, and then continued to have a series of symposiums where we invited members of the deaf and hard of hearing community to come test the product and provide direct feedback to the manufacturers. All these efforts led to uh, the industry investing millions of dollars uh, in 2012, rolling out these technologies across the US. This effort was widely hailed by the hard of hearing, deaf and hard of hearing community, and, and also widely supported by the industry. And the units were widely utilized then as they are today. This all occurred years before the Department of Justice proposed their final regulations on personal captioning. And even then when they were proposed, once again, the industry engaged with our partners in the deaf, uh, individuals in the deaf and hard of hearing community and provided guidance to the Department of Justice, which was mostly accepted and incorporated in the final regulations. Along those same lines, we continue to push for more open captioning programming across the country amongst our members. And in the last couple of years, we've been doing some pilot programs. And while those pilot programs haven't answered all the questions, they did answer one specifically, and that is a one size fits all approach simply doesn't work. It doesn't reflect the realities or nuances of any particular theater or the needs of any particular market or community. So we would suggest and implore that when you reject this legislation, instead allow the people that have ongoing over the years and collaborated, come up with mutually beneficial uh, solutions to continue those efforts, which are ongoing today. Thank you and I'm welcome to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, seeing that Joseph Masher is not in the Zoom, I will be calling on Svetlana Koznetsova to testify. After Svetlana Koznetsova, I will be calling on April Morone and Gail Weiss to testify. Again, if anyone needs interpretation services, please raise hand function and we will have that uh, available for you. Svetlana, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Do you have other interpreter? Are you here? Yes, I'm here. For some reason, the chat. Okay, for whatever reason, the chat. But the type. I can't find the type. I have to sign. So I myself am deaf. Okay, I am deaf. I've been deaf since age two. So I'd first like to mention that anyone who is opposed to the open caption you are really thinking with an ableist attitude. 
And that's like saying, oh, we don't need a ramp for a wheelchair. It's the same thing. Imagine being a deaf person growing up and you experience all these barriers, not only in school, but education, work, enjoyment, all of the above. You don't have the same privileges as hearing people. Even with the captions, I speak Russian. So when I was growing up in Russia, there were no captions on the TV. I couldn't even have access to news or anything. Everything I was completely uninvolved in. When I moved to America, we realized, oh wow, they have captions. It was pretty neat on the television on all the channels. It was a whole new world. It was amazing. When I was 15, that was the first time I had access to captions and it was thrilling. So it wasn't only my deafness, English was my third language, my third. So the captions also helped me improve, improve my English. My parents are both hearing and the captions, English is not their first language either. So my whole family never had captions before. We would just leave them on because we all benefited from them. So people think, oh, you don't need captions on the screen because it bothers other people. You have to think about these, the, the different language barriers. No one's going to complain. If you don't understand a certain language, you have the ability to read it in a different language, correct? You would prefer the captions if you couldn't hear it, same as preferring them if you can't understand the language. It's not fair for us to not have them. I'm sorry, but for other languages, it's acceptable, but for the same language, you don't need them. And Everyone in the theater business, you know, you're surveying people about having the open captions on the screen. Are you surveying both hearing and deaf? Because I'm really curious. That is the question, you know, you're talking about monetary issues, but for the survey, who were the people included? Was it all inclusive? Because I didn't hear about these surveys. All I'm hearing is, oh, we can't afford it. Oh, open captioning is free. We know that the movie theaters can have all of the captions on file. It's a simple press of a button and they turn up on the screen. And the equipment costs more money. The end, it doesn't even work. It doesn't function correctly. So you have to keep giving out free tickets or refunding money. You're wasting your money in that capacity rather than turning on the open captions on the screen. She's frozen. It depends on, you know, the size of the screen, but it's one room. It's simple. It's one room. Just pick a room and use op open caption for the whole day, every day in that one room, that one theater. And they can be either at the top or the bottom of the screen. I'm just curious about this survey because I did a survey myself with over 5,000 people, both hearing and deaf. And the results I got, like I said, it was half hearing, half deaf in the survey. 75% of people supported open caption. 92% said it won't bother me. So a small percentage, a minimal percentage said, oh yeah, it will bother me. And honestly, too bad. And most theaters do have more than one room. So the idea for all the people who are opposing this, maybe turn your sound off, go to a movie theater and you can bring here huge headphones to the theater and you could do it that way. It's uncomfortable, right, to think about that? 
Or maybe we can just turn the captions on the screen. Or think about it, if you don't want to turn the captions on, look at a paper, the whole movie, trying to read it. So stop it, please. I'm really tired of hearing about it. I'm just tired of hearing about it. Enough is enough. And I would just like to add in relation to my survey, I, I wanted to link it in the chat, but like I said, the chat is not enabled. So I was planning on sending the survey, but there is a TEDx talk as well that can be found on the internet if you search it with my name. You could search my name and the TEDx talk. It's um, about seven or eight minutes about open captions. So, uh, you know, I, I had more, but I just would urge you to please think about the deaf and hard of hearing community. And not only that community, but other people, foreign language speakers, ESL, it's really just, it's not fair. So I urge you to think about the bill and set up show times that can be equal for all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, seeing that Council Member Rosenthal has her hand raised, I will call on her for questions. Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you. And I want to thank the city council sergeants who figured out how to put the spotlight on the person who was speaking, not the ASL interpreter. Um, and for the record, I think there have been a couple of speakers who we've missed seeing them because we did not have the spotlight on them. And they're the ones who are speaking. So um, apologies to the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities, Tony. I'm sorry we couldn't see you signing. May I ask the sergeants and the chair for your indulgence. And I would like to give some, I would ask that we allow the person who just spoke, who we were only able to see for a minute, if we could either allow her to give her testimony again or allow her to finish what I think was a longer statement. I also want to put on the record for um, the person who just spoke that you can submit your testimony, including a link to your TED Talk, including your survey, the results of your survey, um, you can submit all of that. And uh, we will follow up with your, with the ASL interpreter today to make sure all of that gets on the record. But Chair, may I ask your indulgence to allow her to finish her testimony with the spotlights on her so we can see the entirety of what she wanted us to hear. Uh, Council Member Wozendel, thank you for your interventions. The request is granted. Yes. So if I could Would ask the, yeah, the, if I could ask. Matt Lana, um, if you were able to see that, you can go ahead and finish your testimony. Um, you just need to turn on your video.
She's there. I don't see a response from Svetlana, uh, Chair Eugene. Okay. So the council member was until the request has been uh, granted. So since she didn't respond, yeah. we Thank may continue, you. but she can jump in anytime. Exactly. Thank you so much, Chair You're Eugene. Welcome. Perhaps someone can reach out to Svetlana and let her know that whenever she jumps back on, we can hear the remainder of her testimony. And um, again, moving forward, um, if we could make sure the spotlight, it, what the public can see uh, is not the ASL interpreter, all of whom I appreciate very much and are doing a beautiful job, but instead we can see the person who is signing. Thank you so much. Thank you. It looks like Svetlana is back. Oh. Uh, would you be able to let her know that she has additional time to testify? Oh, okay. Um, I was actually going back to my my testimonial and, you know, I, I was, I think I was freezing for some parts, so those might've been missed, but I, I think I really mentioned most of what I wanted to say. I don't need to keep going on, but all I wanted to do was to add the two links. Like I said, I can't do that in the chat. Is there a way to? I just want to share the links. The chat function is disabled during city council hearings, but uh, as council member Rosenthal mentioned, you are welcome to share the link in your testimony that you will you can submit to us and we will sh uh, it will be shared as part of the record. Yes, I have done that. Okay, I've done that, thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, I would like to now welcome April Morone to testify. After April Morone, we will have Gail Weiss followed by Max Kwok. Again, if anyone needs interpretation services, please use the raise hand function so we can have that set up for you. Gail, you are sorry, April, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeant's call time. Your time will begin. Okay, hello. I don't want to be on video because I also have autism. So forgive me for that. Um, I am hard of hearing. Um, I'm advocating about the open captions. Um, I think that Sardana said it better than I could have, though, of everything. But I concur, you know, with her, you know, her points were very similar to mine. Um, I have an additional point, though, however. Some of us hard of hearing people and even some deaf people may also have height restrictions. I am under five feet in height. And so to use the closed caption devices is also a disability. Because trying to sit in a chair when you're under five feet and you have to try to bend the closed caption devices that don't want to sit in a cup the way they're supposed to. They tend to fall over when you try to bend them down far enough to where you can actually see them. Which means I would then have to try to move it up a little bit more because if I bend down to where I need to see it, it cuts off the signal to the captions themselves and it won't work. So then I have to bend it back up again, which means I then have to cram my neck up and I have disc issues that hurts my neck. I crush this to my neck. So it's like, okay, this is hurting my neck, but then I have to look at the screen again and then back to it. And that's very painful for my neck and inconvenient. Please consider the heightened disabled as well when considering hard of hearing, I am both. I'm finished. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think that open captions would be better because of that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I will call on Gail Weiss to testify, 
followed by Max Kwok. After Max Kwok, we will have Robert Sunshine. Gail, Gail, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeants call time. And again, if anyone needs interpretation services, please use the raise hand function. Your time will begin. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. And my name is Gail Weiss. Uh, I am on the board of uh, the New York City chapter of HLAA. And uh, I think uh, speaking for many members of HLA, I might say that we would want to go back to the time of uh, silent movies where words were up there on the screen, along with some very nice music. And uh, uh, so, yeah, many of us can indeed hear music, but hearing dialogue is indeed difficult. And, you know, watching it up on the screen is really what we like to do. You know, the, as many people have mentioned, you know, the cup holders we've got involves up and down and up and down. And so you're not really getting into the movie as much as you would want to. And, uh, you know, I've had more than one instance of the uh, devices not working as many others have also mentioned. And, uh, you know, just uh, going and getting a, uh, you know, a free pass to go to another movie doesn't really solve the problem. Occasionally I'm with other people in theater and, you know, I can't say, okay, we all have to leave because my capturing device doesn't work. So I'm sitting there through a movie that I've had difficulty really uh, enjoying. You know, and, you know, enjoying movies is indeed, you know, what uh, what we want to do. Those of us who really do like movies. And, you know, I really think that uh, just that on-screen captioning would be so much appreciated. And, uh, you know, I see it as a win-win, you know, even for the theaters. You know, that was other people were saying. It's going to bring more people to the theaters. They'll bring their relatives with them. They'll bring their friends with them. And, uh, you know, I think it is indeed the way to go and would be much appreciated, you know, if uh, INT 2020 is indeed passed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I would like to call on Max Kwok to testify. After Max, we will have Robert Sunshine, followed by Amanda Perez. Max, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeant's call time. Hi, good morning all. Um, I, I cannot find my uh, written testimony. Uh, can Robert go first? Uh, I, I just want to make some last minute uh, dash to, to find that written testimony first. Sure thing. Uh, Robert, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeant's call time. Your time will begin. Uh, can I be heard at this point? Hello? Yes, we hear you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to just quickly thank the chairman and members of the committee uh, for providing the opportunity to testify. My name is Bob Sunshine. I'm the executive director of the National Association of Theater Owners of New York State. And we represent most of the theaters uh, in New York City. Um, I'm not going to read my testimony because of so many things I've heard today. Um, but I do want to emphasize we are not the enemy. Again, I say it, we are not the enemy. We're not opposed to open captioning. We actually want to provide more open captioning where it would work for both the community and where it would work for the theater owners. Um, we are doing open captioning now voluntarily. People in who attend the theaters can come to our management and say, would you please show a movie this week in open captioning? And every time where we could comply, we do. So I, I, I ask, now that we have a very good and productive relationship and dialogue with the advocates, um, why do we need legislation at this point now? Theater owners know what works. And we want to work with the community to expand it. This bill does not work. This bill will hurt local theaters in communities, and many of them might have to close. We need to talk it out, and we need to find out what works best for both sides. What is proposed in this bill is much more than what the advocates have asked for. 
And as it was already testified by one of our members, it's impossible. It's impossible to administer. So let's not look upon the theater owners as adversarials. We want to work with the community. We did it with federal law before, and now we think we can do it by agreeing and working with you and finding a good solution. There is no need to legislate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'm calling on Max Kwok once again to testify. After Max Kwok, we will have Amanda Perez, followed by Rob Westerling. Max, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeant's call time. Hi. Uh, so again, I cannot find my written testimony, but just hearing a lot of uh, uh, perspective from a lot of people, especially from those who oppose the issue about uh, requiring legislation is, for example, at AMC Theaters uh, Empire 25 in Times Square, um, you know, as AMC subs members or A-list members, we are supposed to be able to enjoy free Wi-Fi. But that theater's Wi-Fi has been gone down, has, has been down for like the past 12 months or more, and nobody's really fixing it. And, you know, I, I actually went to talk to the theater manager or, or people like that, you know, to say, can you please fix that next time I come in? But still, it has not been fixed. So some kind of mandate is, is needed to just implement this open captioning thing for people who are hearing impaired or who are immigrants who want to learn English as a second language. I mean, I'm an immigrant. I'm a non-immigrant turned immigrant turned U.S. citizen. But at this point, I still find a lot of movies that that to me is like hard to comprehend without the aid of you know open captioning. For example, the movie called Dune, you know, sci-fi movie featuring a lot of uh, proper nouns, you know geographical proper nouns or, or um, names of people who are just you know, hard to pronounce or, or a lot of synonyms for, for, for words or simple words uh, that, we, that we know but we don't know about their synonyms. So having open captions, we could you know, quickly resort to a, you know, a Merriam-Webster dictionary to look them up, to really increase our vocabulary, to really uh, help improve our understanding and you know, our conversation, our understanding of this country uh, or, or various different types of culture. Uh, over there. Uh, I, I actually work at Ernst & Young. I, I'm not aware of that Ernst & survey. I mean, even the same employee, like that kind of survey or, or studies is not really published to everybody at the firm. So I, I'm going to have to do some Googling to find that survey out to really understand the perspective. And also going to uh, Mr. Uh, Doug Murdoch's uh, 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 difficulty of implementing that, that law, right? When, when he spoke, it's really hard to hear every single word of uh you know that's coming out of his mouth only because of the audio quality uh of this uh session i don't know why was this something about his microphone uh or, or something like that i mean i don't want to be disrespectful but again during that time i mean people could you know watch the replay of this webcast it's just very hard to hear every single word of his argument um if if uh according to you know Svalana, the, the, the the Russian um, woman who, who, is, uh, who is deaf and, and all that, uh, she was saying, you know, the open caption should be easily turned on or off. So if that's the case, like, why is it so hard to implement this, this uh, mechanism uh, for open captioning? I, I mean, I, I simply don't understand it. So to, to the extent, I mean, to the extent we don't need open captioning, that would be great. I mean, I don't want to impose this thing to, to, onto everybody else, but really, we found the open captioning uh, time slots very inconvenient, right? Usually it's focused only in the afternoons, right? Sometimes I, I have work. I can only go to theaters during the evening. And I just realized we don't have that availability in the evening. And open captioning is not available Time to has out, out there. So, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I see that Council Member Rosenthal has um, her hand raised. Council Member, if you would like to go ahead with your question. Thank you. Um, and again, I can't quite see all the people who are on um, the Zoom right now. But if there is one person, one panelist from the movie theater interest, uh, the movie theater industry, who could answer the question that was just raised? 
it's a critical question. What makes it hard in terms of simply, it's my understanding that it is a switch. You either turn on or to turn off. Much like the way for this hearing today, you can press a button to get, out to, to get the captions or press another button and not see the captions. But it's not difficult to press the button to see the captions. Is there something in the way movies are in the reel or the disc or however it, it works these days? Um, technologically that it makes it difficult to turn on the captions. And maybe look to see if anyone's raised their hand. If they're not, that's fine too. Um, um, it'll be a question. Sure. Um, I'd be happy to answer the questions for Ms. Smith again. So the uh, projections today are basically uh, computers. And like all computers, they have capacity limits. So when you have uh, uh, files come in with movies on them, there's multiple files, and, and these files take up a considerable amount of space. So in some of those files will include an open caption version of the movie. So, so when you have an auditorium, let's say a facility showing five or six different features, and they've, and they've got the files downloaded in multiple auditoriums, there's limited capacity sometimes, or there's a risk of limited capacity. So absent the, the uh, open caption show being publicized and scheduled, they're not always going to download that as a capture. Number. So it's not a matter of you just simply say, I want it, turn it on. It has to then be ingested in the system, and this could take some time. And the additional complication of that is... A lot of times there's pre-sales on these movies that come out. Yeah, so when these totally movies are advertised, they're either advertised, if you look on a web page or a third party page like Fandango, you'll see that the, the films will feature the international symbols of CC for closed captioning or OC for open captioning. And so when, when we advertise the films, realize that that OC means open caption or they don't even look. And so that we run into customer issues that become unhappy with the open captions. What we try to do is make sure it's clearly publicized and advertised. And if you, if we, we got to the point over the years that if you go to like Fandango and you hover your uh, uh, mouse over, over the uh, symbol next to the, whether it's closed caption or open caption, a box will pop up. So we've tried to be very informative to the public both those who need captions and those who desire or those that don't, that they understand what exactly that CC and OC is. So it isn't simply a matter of plug, plug and play. And there are capacity limitations and there are ingestion time periods that impact the ability to simply do that. And hopefully that answered your question. If not, I'm more than happy to, to clarify. Um. I, so I really just want to focus on, I'm hoping everyone can hear me, I really am in the middle of this event, um, but uh, so, so really just focusing on the technology, which I think was the first part of your response, what I heard you say was that it takes up more file space, more storage uh, in the system compared to want something with open captions versus something with not. In other words, I'm making this up. One thing is 10 gigabytes and another thing is 15 gigabytes because it has the open caption. Is that what I heard you say? And then in the next battle, I'm in the world. And so it should never, ever have to be. Can we Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. There's, there's somebody talking in the background. I can't, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear your question clearly. I'm sorry. I think if you give her a minute, she's going to get someplace a little quieter. Gotcha. Okay. 
Uh, thank you for that. I am going to go someplace quieter. Um, thank you. Oh, not quieter. Helicopters. Um, so my question was, I, I want to focus on the first part of your response, which had to do with the storage required in the system for an open caption movie uh, com compared to the other. So in other words, one might be, and I'm making up si sizes here because I don't know this, one might be 10 gigabytes and the other is 15 gigabytes. Is that, was that your yeah. argument? Okay. No, Great. not just, really. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, I wanted to understand what you said. So if it's, I'm not saying it, please. It's, it's, it's not, it's not necessarily that I'm not talking about just the open capture file. These systems have to take every film that's going to be shown in that auditorium and ingest it into the thing. All the trailers get downloaded, ingested, and they all the paid programming gets downloaded, ingested. There's, it's a. It, I wish I had a. a, a handling. No, but I. I think what I'm saying. I think I do understand what you're saying. So let me try saying it again, and perhaps uh, I can articulate it better. Always, when you are running a movie theater, you have to download a lot of things trailers, advertisements, movies, a ton of things, right? And that takes up X amount of storage. Now, if you have to have, have to have open captions as well, now it's X plus one amount of storage. Is that accurate? Yes, if you have to download the open caption file, that would be one more file. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. And you also have to All get done. a set of keys from the distributor. You can't just turn on the open what? camera. Shop. Each film comes with security protocols that we call keys. And I'm not the biggest techno guy, and there may be some of the other guys on here are, but they come with what's called a key that allows the theater to initiate the film. Without that key, they could download the file, but they can't actually get the program. To right. So currently, um, some of the theaters on their own, without any legislation, are showing both the open <laughs> caption and the not open caption, right? So <laughs> they already have in hand the, the key for the security to allow it to play. Is that yes, accurate? If, if they're going to schedule And this, if they like, needed the to show... If they needed to show, if they wanted, if they were required to show that movie more than one time in, say, the single day, would they have to get another key or another no. required no, they sign just, off? No, they just have to get it to be able to make it function. And once they have it, it's, I, I assume this is more a studio administrative aspect to understand what's being shown and what isn't being shown, as well as to contact uh, against piracy of the product itself of course every industry is doing everything it can to uh, of course obviously okay i just wanted to make sure i understood is there any other component so they it it requires more file space and it requires getting a special uh, uh bowl, some art to use well, the I, open I caption those two technical things it definitely requires that, and it definitely requires advertising. It definitely requires the theater operators to test the multiple formats. When they download a file, when they ingest it, they do have to run it to make sure, not the whole file, but they run it to make sure it's functioning appropriately. So this just adds one more component to that. that they have to make yeah, sure. I mean, just like it wasn't functioning well for me to be inside my event versus standing out here, that took extra time, right? Was it worth it? I think so, but okay, I got you. Thank you very much. No, you're welcome. And 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 again, I I, I believe we believe it's worth it too. It's just a matter of what's the appropriate or the best way to accomplish this objective to enhance the access to our theaters. Well, I, I that doesn't come across in your testimony, frankly. I hear your words were on the same side, 
right? I hear your assertions. We don't need laws to do it. I also heard someone say, you know, we negotiated with the federal government on an ADA response. No, no that was no, for the closed captions. You negotiated with the federal government to have no. that. No? no, we didn't. No, what we did is we went with our partners in the deaf and hard of hearing community and we reviewed what was being proposed by the Department of Justice. And collectively, we put together recommendations from the deaf mm-hmm. community. We, it was a joint accord. It got a lot of press back in 2015, I believe. And from those th- discussions, we made recommendations to the Department of Justice. Now, uh-huh. At that time. If you were oh. making recommendations today, and given that we're talking about a percentage of showings, what would your recommendation be? Well, in my experience, uh, and again, I've been doing this for almost 30 years. It isn't that simple. It's not that hard either. What it is, is it requires some understanding of the needs of the market and coming up with a reasonable. But you don't know the needs because you don't know the untapped market, right? Okay, so for example, I'll give you, when I was inside at Reclinic, which I was for 20 years, we had open caption programs across the country without any request, simply because we understood the market. And I'll give you a good example. New Wait, York, what business were you in? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. The what? I was, what with, Re- I was with Regal Entertainment Group. I oh, Regal. In-house with them for 20 years. And uh, you always had open captions. Well, when, when the studio started providing them, now back in the day, back in the 90s, the open captions were burnt on prints. We didn't have digital. So you had to, you had to get the print, and they didn't make enough prints for every theater. So the prints kind of bicycle it around. But yes, we've always had them. And we showed them back then when there weren't as many. We did, we did different things. But we focused on areas with high anticipated or known high populations of individuals that were deaf and hard of hearing. For example, uh, DC, Rochester, New York, certain areas in California. We always focused in areas where we also knew, because we could look it up, where the, the deaf and blind schools were to make sure that we had facilities that were in those. That was your proxy, got it. That would provide this type of access. And, and mm-hmm. it's been a developing thing. I mean, I know mm-hmm. today there's, People complain about this technology that's out there today. It's not the technology. It's human failures. The technology may not be great, but it is what we worked hard with the community to make sure they were part of the development process. I mean, multiple times in Washington, D.C., we did these demonstrations so they could directly talk to the manufacturers. It was a great process. Now, over time... Right always been some that just want open caption and we get it so we're we're trying to get that to work too it's just the amount right because the technology has changed and it's new world new technology new ease of downloading open caption movies whatever there's a lot okay i i'm really trying to um understand the point of view but i feel i i i I'm not quite sure, and again, I apologize. There's another helicopter um, going over my head, so I apologize. That's right, you can't hear. <laughs> no, I can't, I can't uh, hear the helicopter, hear you're now. okay. Oh, you can't hear the helicopter, okay, no. good. Um, great, so um, my question is, what's your answer to Svetlina when she was talking about all the things that she missed out on her life. What's your answer to the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, just like her, the people who may not live near a deaf and blind school? Well, again, my answer to her is, is, is these companies out there, if you make a request for an open caption show, almost all of them I know of have that program. Or if you want a dedicated opportunity to have it at a particular facility, it's just a matter of dialogue. I mean, I've been, look, I know. So somebody has to know to be able to ask. 
right? They need well, to all... know that there's an option out there. Okay, I've been doing this a long time, and I still run into people today that didn't know, that don't know there's personal capturing technologies. This is notwithstanding the fact that we work directly with the largest deaf and hard of hearing, uh, hard of hearing I know. in the country to get that word out. But it still happens. And, and I'm going to say this to you, what you need to understand, and, and, and everyone should, is that you can't look at the deaf and hard of hearing community as any different than any other segment of our society. Not everybody goes to the news. And I used to say this all the time. It's like the field of dreams argument. If you build it, they will come. Well, that's not true. I'm not going to come see a slasher movie that has open captions simply because it has open captions. I'm going to go see the movies I want to see. And as a consequence of that, it isn't necessarily going to drive the attendance that they like to understand. I'm an advocate, and you know, I don't bring this up, but I'm also the parent of a deaf child. I've experienced it personally for over 30 years. I know exactly what it is. I've utilized all of these technologies. And as they were developed, are they the best they could be today? Maybe not, but, but, but they were the best that could be at the time. Do all theaters and all theater personnel manage that equipment effectively? They not, and they could do a much better job. And that's what leads to these failures. When I was at Regal, what we did is we put our trailer, policy trailer, it started before before the previews was captioned so that anybody that had the technology was glasses or the seat mounts or neck loops, which Regal had all three, could be able to go in there and know that their devices were functioning appropriately well before, sometimes 15, 20 minutes before the, the, the feature movie ever started. Because notwithstanding their best efforts, sometimes the devices in the auditorium, particularly the infrared ones, they just weaken and die over time. The Wi-Fi ones just stop, and it's very difficult to catch those. And you have a combination of all those things in theaters today. So I understand, I respect everybody's opinion here. I respect the way they feel. I, I respect their desires. And I think the industry, at least in my involvement, and for 30 years I've been a leader with them in trying to work and increase and enhance access, that is still the desire. Things have changed over time. Maybe we need more open caption than what's being provided. But it isn't, it isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. It just doesn't work. So that's all I would suggest. And we are Got actively it. talking with the advocates, and we are actively doing pilots now in various areas in the country to try and find a way to give some specific guidance to our members. You know, you got big okay. members that have I, more tools than little guys. Sorry. Yep. Nope, I appreciate that very much. I appreciate your answer. Your child is very lucky to have you as a parent. I still can't get a cochlear implant for several of the people who live in my public housing um, in my development in my district. I can't get them anything because it's not available. They can't afford it. They don't have access. No one's paying attention to them. So Look, uh, people are in all different types of situations, and the role of government is to try to help those often, uh, to help everyone, to help everyone, Agreed. including Agreed. business industry uh, and people most in need. So I appreciate that. I actually am at an event, so I want to apologize in advance to uh, the remaining people who are going to testify. A, sorry I made you wait so long, and B, I might get shut down because my phone is losing battery. But um, I will read everyone's testimony. I appreciate everyone for being on here today. And um, thank you. Thank you, sergeants and Chair Eugene for giving me an opportunity to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you for your advocacy here, so that's a good. Thank you. Uh, we will now... Um, Continue on. I would like to welcome Roberta Lawrence to testify. After Roberta Lawrence, I will be calling on Tony Iacolucci and then Ruth Bernstein. Again, if anyone uh, requires interpretation services, please use the raise hand function. Please use the raise hand function only if you need translation or interpretation services. Um, and 
Roberta, you are welcome to start as soon as the sergeant's call time. Okay, thank you. It's time we'll begin. Thank you. Um, I want to thank council members and chair Eugene, I'm sorry, I'm very nervous, chair um, Eugene, for allowing me to testify. Um, I want to testify as to the egregious mishandling of my late mother's and my disability discrimination case that we filed with the Human Rights Commission in 2016. This is my mother, nice lady with the leopard sweater on. Uh, my mother lived in a, lived in a rent stabilized uh, apartment with a bad landlord for years. She was denied appliances that were supposed to come with the apartment. It was in such bad shape that when I moved in to take care of her uh, in 19, uh, sorry, in two, uh, 2010, I called the Department of Buildings. I got a lot of support from Councilman Halloran at the time and from Assemblyman Bronstein, who was a wonderful advocate for seniors. I moved in with my mom when she was 90. Uh, the landlord hadn't repaired anything in her apartment since she moved in in 1980. The building had gone co-op. She couldn't buy, so she was in no man's land. The co-op hated her because she wasn't an owner, and the landlord wanted her out. I want to show the nexus between um, rent-regulated landlords uh, using the opportunity when an elderly or disabled um, tenant needs a disability accommodation. They're not going to give it to you. They want you out. Stop it. Sorry, it's my dog. Um, so I, uh, I filed, I was, I was pointed to the Human Rights Commission in 2013 under the, um, under the leadership of, of uh, Commissioner Gatlin. Uh, my mother needed a lift in the lobby to get her from the lower lobby to the upper lobby so she could go out the main entrance and enjoy the gardens. She needed bathroom accommodations within her apartment. She was, she, she was infirm and she was going blind. She could not climb into the bathtub. Um, Patricia Gatlin's uh, agency handled the complaint with dispatch. They found probable cause for discrimination um, and retaliation within a year, and we were at oath for a hearing within 14 months. Commissioner Gatlin was replaced by Commissioner Malalas, and there was a, a, a change in the tenor of the commission. Um, my mother was forced at the conciliation agreements to take a non-ADA compliant bathtub cutout, which uh, didn't work for her. And the thing is, for leverage, you're told, we were told by the LE, the Law Enforcement Bureau Executive Director, if your mother doesn't take this, we're dismissing the case. This is a mantra that is prevalent throughout the whole process. Time has expired. Thank you. Um, we will now continue on to testimony from Tony Iacolucci, followed by Ruth Bernstein and then Miriam Fisher. Again, if anyone requires interpretation services, please use the raise hand function. Oh, I apologize. Um, Amanda Perez, I do see that we jumped over you. So I will go back. Um, we will hear from Amanda Perez first, followed by Tony Iacolucci and then Ruth Bernstein. Uh, Amanda, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeants call time. The time will begin. Sure, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, hello? we can. Awesome. Well, hello, Chair Eugene and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Amanda Perez. I'm the general manager at the AMC Tips Bay 15 movie theater location. As you may be aware, AMC and the movie theater industry in New York City are still in the process of recovering from the most challenging times in modern history. Movie theaters in New York City were closed for 50 weeks during the COVID-19 pandemic. And once our theaters were allowed to reopen, we were limited by capacity restrictions that remained in place until almost June of this year. To state the obvious, AMC's in New York City theaters earned no income during this 12 month period and were still 
in the beginning steps of the process of returning to pre-pandemic numbers. Despite the challenges we face as an industry, AMC has taken substantial steps to provide an open caption showing in our greater New York City market. Currently 16 of AMC theaters in the greater New York City market participate in our open caption national program. From October 1st to November 11th of this year, our 16 locations had 914 open, cap open caption shows. Um, these 914 open caption shows average about 12 guests per show, which is approximately 5.8% of occupancy, leaving 94.8% of the seats for these showings unsold. Additionally, 122 of these 914 showtimes sold zero tickets. 266 of the 914 showtimes sold one to five tickets and none of these 914 showtimes sold out. AMC's New York City theaters look forward to continue our work with the open and hard of hearing community to respond to the demand of open caption showings. However, we feel that the INT 2020 by creating an arbitrary 50% requirement for open caption showings jeopardizes the recovery of the movie theater industry in one of the most important markets in the country. Thank you again for, the, for your time and the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing that Tony Iacolucci and Ruth Bernstein are not in the Zoom and Robert Westerling is also not in the Zoom, we will be moving on to testimony from Miriam Fisher, followed by Robert Wolf and Diana Prashad. Uh, Miriam, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeants call time. And again, if anyone interpretation services, please use the raise hand function. Uh, actually, I apologize, Miriam. It looks like Council Member Rosenthal does have her hand raised, so we will go okay. to her. I'm, I'm sorry, we're, I'm also a, a, a meeting on accessibility in the subway. There's kind of a schedule conflict and I'm running back and forth. Do you mind if I just do my testimony? Because I have to leave. Not I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Miriam Fisher. I'm a disability advocate. Uh, I'm advocating for open captions on movies and public theaters, following models in other cities and countries to fully include people with hearing impairments and participation in cultural events. I wear two hearing aids and have used varying types of technology, including my cell phone, which I, I put aside um, with uh, the app uh, Live Transcribe, and I've been told the glare of the phone to take it away. It's annoying people, the light. And I've become very uncomfortable, but that was it, my, my option. Um, cells can obviously disturb the audience members with um, their illumination and require frequent checks to follow dialogue. I have requested, and I'm giving you just a few tidbits of some of my experiences trying to enjoy a movie without captions. I. I have uh, requested captions at public libraries and senior centers which receive public money and have heard of objections from those who find the, uh, it distracting. Uh, though they will watch movies with subtitles, uh, foreign movies without protest. Just an example, a movie facilitator, discussion facilitator at, at a senior center with certainly other people with uh, hearing difficulties said he saw I talked with other people so I couldn't possibly have trouble hearing uh, both insensitive and ignorant. He said he won't aid discussions if they show uh, mo English movies with uh, captions. The director of the same center in um, New York City ran out of the room when the option for captions came on the screen after I made the request. I had to involve help from the New York City Department of Aging as the senior, as the center I knew received public money. A similar situation happened at a New York public library until I again, again reminded that they were receiving public money and denying reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities disabilities. I'm um, exhausted by these kinds of encounters and no longer look forward to participation, anticipating more encounters. Uh, often 
captions on uh, in there, despite those occasional who find it distracting, uh, many remark at how more easily they can follow the words or segments that they couldn't previously and note song lyrics, which was a big thing, are especially hard to follow and become available the captions. They're also an aid for segments of the larger population, those who speak English as a foreign language, children learning to read and honing their skills. And as a retired reading teacher, I'm very conscious of that, how that can help uh, children. Uh, need fully available movies so people can go to movies as everyone else when it fits their plans and schedules, not relegated to time limited uh, intervals and times of day. Captions are the vector that can integrate people with, within the larger world of social events and the media that so many without hearing struggles take for granted. Thank you, Helen Rosenthal, for letting me squeeze in. Um, I'm back to uh, Sydney talking about accessibility at the subways. Thank you. They're, going, they're meeting at the same time. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Rosenthal, I see you lowered your head. Are you, do you have any questions? Great, thank you. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, actually, I want to give Jerry Bergman an opportunity. Uh, if Jerry Bergman could be unmuted, uh, if that would be okay. Um, I think Jerry, uh, if he's there, um, yeah, I think Jerry, can I just ask you real quickly, did you have some thoughts about what Mr. Smith um, was saying? And I was wondering what your take on that would be. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I've been patiently sitting and listening to uh, the industry spokespeople. And I just wanted to set the record straight about a couple of things. Um, Raymond Smith said they've been collaborating with the deaf and hard of hearing for a long time. That's not so. Uh, they were not providing any access for deaf and hard of hearing people until Mr. Waldo brought a lawsuit on the West Coast it cost them a great deal of money when they lost that suit. I brought an action in New York against AMC, and that action got captions like on the West Coast in New York State at all the AMC theaters. Both of those actions preceded the regulation that the Department of Justice put into place. So it was legal action that spurred that. Um, I also wanted to say that um, we are now in a situation where the, the cinemas have suddenly started to schedule open caption showings. And I think if there's anybody out there who thinks that this advent in the recent months has happened out of a desire to serve our needs, they're mistaken. I think if this action wouldn't have been taken by the city council and follow actions in other cities and states that they would still be ignoring us. And the evidence I have of that is that the deaf entertainment access uh, foundation, DEAF had been asking the major cinema uh, operators through their local managers to schedule open caption, occasional open caption showings. And almost in most cases, they've invariably, invariably been denied access. Um, it's only been in the last two weeks as a result of this action that the industry has offered to meet and talk with us. So we're now doing that. But uh, as far as I know, there was absolutely no involvement of the Hearing Loss Association or the advocates I'm familiar with in the advent of the open caption scheduling. Thank you, Helen.
Council Member Rosenthal, did you um, have any other follow up? Thank you very much for that. I mean, I would love to give um, the movie industry an opportunity to respond. I know this hearing is going very long and I know there are still people who want to testify, but if Mr. Smith could be allowed to give a quick response. And what I'm going to encourage everyone to do is if you have a different additional thoughts after this hearing, responses you'd like to make to something that you heard today, you can submit additional testimony uh, within, uh, you tell me, committee council, 72 hours um, uh, by a emailing testimony at council.nyc.gov. And I will assure you that I will be reading it as well as the committee staff. We are very <coughs> interested in hearing your response to anything that you heard today. But can we allow Mr. Smith um, you know, a minute or two to respond. Is is that okay? Is that okay? Okay, I'll, I'll just be brief. Listen, I I know what we've done. I know what I did, and I've been doing it since the '90s. Now, I, I certainly can't sit here and say I've dealt with every deaf organization or hard of hearing organization in the United States because I haven't. I don't know all of them. There were two referenced today I had never heard of, but I have been associated with the uh, since 1990, 1990, I believe. And I have been involved in creating and enhancing access since then. If you spoke with individuals that uh, were part of the Coalition for Movie Captioning back in the 90s, or you spoke with individuals that are associated with certain deaf schools in this country, including Tennessee School for the Deaf, they could certainly confirm it. The litigation with John Waldo did not do what it did. That litigation, and the only reason Regal was in that litigation, because, and listen, I respect John. We go back a long way. We don't always agree, but I respect him. And he wanted us to uh, do something in that litigation, which we were already doing. And we told him we're already going to be rolling this out. But he wanted a firm date to roll out this new technology. We couldn't give it to him because we were at the whim of the manufacturer. So he did sue Regal. And then the, his claims ultimately got dismissed because it became moot. His claim that we were violating the ADA because we didn't have the time to the suit were not deemed moot. But his claims that we have to install the technology, which is today the complaints are about, uh, was already moot because we did install the technology before the, the case went to trial. Now, as far as all the rest of it, we've been doing for years. We, these companies could probably go back and establish when they started these programs. I'm not going to dispute that when this legislation started in New York, that uh, the activists or whatever the industry didn't reach out to try to find the activists to be able to start having dialogue in the, that locality, it's certainly it's true. It's not a new subject, and I'll, I'll leave it there because it's terrible. Okay. Thank you, though, for the response. Thank you. Um, now we will continue on to the next witness. I have uh, Robert Wolf testifying next, followed by Diana Prashad and Daniel Brooks. Uh, Robert, you can go ahead as soon as the sergeant's call time. And of course, if anyone needs interpretation services, uh, the activist, sorry, you need to reach out, try to find the The time will begin. Thank you, though, for the response. Hi, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong email, which was about echo, echo capture. So I'm sorry, I hit the wrong one. Thank you. Okay, sorry, thank you. Bye-bye. 
Um, we will now move on to testimony from Diana Prashad, followed by Daniel Brooks. Um, again, if anyone needs interpretation services, please use the raise hand function. Diana, you can begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. The time will begin. Hello. Hi, yes, Diana, okay. go ahead. Yes, um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good afternoon, committee members. My name is Diana Prashad. I support the bill set forth today. My testimony, however, is about my ongoing discrimination with New York City agencies as a black female and a LGBTQ under the Blasio pertaining to the arena of human rights. I would like to publicize how the intersection issues of race, socioeconomic, sexual orientation, and otherness of LGBTQ status has impacted my response from, from agencies such as HPD, DSS, DOI, and I believe this is to be the product of both our socioeconomic disenfranchisement and systemic discrimination. For the past 20 months as a homeowner in the development of 200 plus town homes, which are bound by a 25 year on an occupancy clause, I have been retaliated against by HPD, the agency who I, who I not only purchased my home from in 2007, but to who I am contractually bound until 2032. From 2012 to present, some homeowners in this development under the same self 25 year owner's occupancy clause have been illegally converting these homes into rental properties and moving to other established locations, leaving the tenants and occupation of residents in violation of our contracts. Many of these longstanding breaches are the handiwork of individuals who have a relationship with New York City, such as New York City employees or individuals who work for the developers of our housing. Some of these homeowners are even, are even illegally renting these homes back to, the, to DSS and DSS and receiving New York City housing voucher payments after they have received 100,000 grants to remain in these homes as their primary residency until 2032. Needless to say, this has adversely impacted impacted our community as a whole since it allows our property values to further plummet. Additionally, some of these longstanding breaches are being perpetuated by Caucasian homeowners who were given an incentive to obtain these homes and are now using them as income sources. Some homeowners that some homeowners have even taken out secondary mortgages to list these homes as rental properties and um, part of New York and is part of New York City records. But yet under HBD this administration has failed to take swift and decisive actions. I believe this is due to the fact that the majority of the homeowners in our community are black and brown people, and they do not care about us or the viability of our community or our property values. HPD, per our contracts, has the authority to both monitor and enforce our owner occupancy clause for compliance, but have only done so under the Bloomberg administration. These illegal conversions have been an ongoing issue from 2012 and remains an issue today with HPD and other agencies such as DOI being cognizant of it but failing to act to address the discriminatory treatment of homeowners in this development. The issue of selective enforcement, the issues of favoritism, which is the end product of select homeowners being, being allowed to use these homes as income while the others are not. The conflict of interest of DSS and DHA paying select homeowners to bring their homeless clients with dubious backgrounds into our communities and homes who have been vented. Well, we, I have been vented, I should say and the resulting issues such as the crime and safety issues that we are made to endure as black people in compliance. As a homeowner, my wife and I are experiencing right. issues such as now seeing the sales of illicit drugs from the house attached to mines. We are also being actively harassed, experienced homophobic term targeting by these illegal place DSS clients and are also experiencing safety issues since they have been, since multiple att uh, attempts at physical attacking us. We have, I have brought this to your attention since this situation adversely affects roughly 200 black and brown homeowners and taxpayers in, in, in my community. We need oversight and accountability and we need your committees to enact legislation to protect us from these blatant acts of discrimination. Thank you. Thank you. 
we will, I seeing that Daniel Brooks is not in the Zoom, uh, please let me know if we have inadvertently missed anyone that registered to testify today and has yet to be called on. Please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing no additional raised hands, Chair Eugene, do you wish to go have a second round for witnesses? Chair Eugene, uh, would you like to have a second round of witnesses? Chair is muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, thank you. I was talking, but I wasn't mute. Now, do you have more uh, speakers? We do not have any additional witnesses. However, if you would like to have a second round of questions or testimony from any witnesses, um, it's at your discretion. Yes, thank you very much. I know that uh, people have been here for a long time. And, uh, but I, I still have uh, some few questions for the industry. Are they still there? The representative? Okay, anyone can answer. But what I want, would like to know, if they can tell us, you know, are our movies uh, with open uh, caption currently shown in New York City? Anyone can answer that. Sorry, can you repeat the question, please, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are our movies with open captions currently shown in New York City? Are, are, yes, absolutely. Could you give us some, some detail about, you know, uh, the um, you know, I would like to give you specific details and I would like to see who else from the circuits is currently on right now because they can tell you right now, you know, their specific show times and, and playlist. Um, I'm just clicking through the Zoom here to see who else might be on. But I know that... Uh, they vary. I know that AMC has a pilot running in New York City at, at three of their theaters, uh, two on the Upper West Side, one in, in Times Square, and um, they're offering a, a number, and I, I will look up the data right now because I have the data here if no one else is available um, mm -hmm. to provide it. Uh, but they're yeah, yeah. also offered uh, available upon request. And, and the issue, Mr. Chairman, with this legislation, again, is the quantity of open captioning shows and the ability to play the um, number that's set in this bill is, is just impossible to comply with um, and would lead to further financial loss. And again, you've heard a lot of testimony about the difficulty of the theaters. I wanna again reiterate some of the testimony. We want people in our theaters and we clearly wanna welcome people with disabilities, including people who are deaf and hard of hearing. And, you know, I personally had conversations with Mr. Bergman and Mr. Waldo, and they've been very productive conversations and very respectful conversations. And we hope to continue those conversations. Um, and we wanna be able to find a solution that works for everybody. I just don't think that this legislation does. And I think it will only lead to the detriment of all the stakeholders because these theaters won't be able to stay in business if this legislation is put in as is, um, and a mandate like this just won't work. So we're, we're trying to find a way of expanding open captioning, a way of improving closed captioning. We need as many people to come to the theaters as possible. And if there's an untapped audience that's out there, we welcome them with open arms, everybody, and, and want everybody to feel respected, welcomed, and valued. And that's critically important. Um, and I'm just finding the data here. So I appreciate your time. The number of open caption movies, sir, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, 6,093 open caption show times from one of the cinema chains. And the other number here, just bear with me, please. Um, in New York City, one of them is uh, offering 
914 open caption show times. And again, the data we have is that the audience is not turning out for them. Could they do a better job of advertising them? We're trying to talk with Mr. Bergman and, and Mr. Waldo about doing just that. Could we do a better job of figuring out, um, you know, the feedback from all audiences, from people who are deaf and hard of hearing, from people who are not, what they like, what they don't like, of course. But all these things take a little bit of time. They take a little bit of time to set up the proper methodology. They take a little bit of time to determine the right data and the right facts. And unfortunately, you know, we look at this legislation, I, I, I uh, you know, with all due respect, look at that 50% number, I think it's quite arbitrary and again, unworkable. And we have a subset of New York City data right now that's very actionable. And all it shows is that the capacity is not, the, the auditoriums are not filled. They're, they're almost completely empty, 95, 94% empty. And if there is an untapped audience, if, if there's an um, a, a aggregate uh, increase in the audience, that would be something the theaters would welcome. Again, the theaters want people to come to the movies and not give people a reason to stay home. So we want to continue to work with the advocates. We want to work with all advocates um, and, and have dialogue to figure something out that works. Our fear is that this legislation does not work and will only compound the financial problems facing the theaters. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, based on your statement, it seems that the, uh, the number of captions represent a big challenge for the industry. Is that correct? Hello? Is that correct? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just had some trouble I unmuting. Yeah, yes, statement. sir. Yeah. The, yes, Mr. Chairman. The issue is if the number of captions is set in stone, if it is mandated, and the demand is not there, then you will have movies being forced to be played to empty auditoriums. And the problem with that is you will no longer have movie theaters if they are required to play films with no audiences. Um, I, I defer to the theater managers, I defer to the theater owners who know this issue inside and out, but the experience that I've looked at in terms of the data and that I've heard is that when the audience isn't coming, the theaters aren't making revenue, they can no longer uh, afford to do that. And there are the technical challenges and the logistical challenges of such a high percentage. And I think that if we look at other jurisdictions who have um, open caption showtimes that are really responsive to the demand, that it works well. And unfortunately, a rigid mandate that uh, is, is, is uh, set in stone with a number that's arbitrary will not work well. And so we're trying to find what that number will be and that's why there are pilot projects and that's why there is data. And this decision and this discussion should be data driven. Um, it, it should be uh, assessing the New York market and trying to find a solution that works for New York City, which is unlike every other market in the country. So we're trying to find the right solution. We're, as someone said earlier, we're not the bad guys. We want people to come to the movies and we particularly want the deaf and hard of hearing community to feel welcome and an integral part of the audience at the movies. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. You know, uh, if the bill uh, gets uh, uh, enacted, uh, it will require also movie theater to advertise their, uh, their capability of movies with open captioning. Is there any other uh, challenge that you believe that will uh, uh, imposed uh, to the company? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. The, the advertising portion is one that we want to really work with the advocates to, to determine what is the best um, verbiage, if you will, to, to um, advertise. Uh, in, our, in some of our conversations, uh, we've been told that it, it should be consistent to say either OC or open captioning. Um, there, there have been experiments to try to really clarify what that might mean for some audiences who are not familiar with OC or open captioning. And so sometimes it will say uh, provided with or offered with English subtitles. Um, the idea is that all audiences should be able to clearly understand how the movie is being offered. 
And, and this goes beyond just um, open captioning or closed captioning. People want to go see a movie in IMAX. They need to know that it's playing in IMAX. They need to know that that, that theater and that screen uh, has the IMAX availability or other um, availabilities, other types of um, projection equipment or other types of technology. And so we're trying to figure out what is the best fit. And again, want to work with the advocates to determine both the advertising, but most especially the, the quantity. And, and I, I'll be the first to say, you know, people should feel free to come to the movie theater and have the accessibility to see the show that they want when they want to. We're not seeing that that is the case. And these businesses are trying to accommodate everyone. Um, and so we're trying to find that right balance. And unfortunately, this legislation does not find that right balance at all. And we're reluctantly opposing it. Again, we want people from the deaf and hard of hearing community to be regular patrons at the movies. Um, you, you, you mentioned that you from the industry, you are not the enemies. And you do want the people to enjoy the movies. And uh, you are willing to dialogue to continue the conversation with uh, the uh, advocates. But you probably, not probably, you heard also the other speakers that share with us the difficulties, the challenges that they, 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 are, they used to face in terms of equipment, device, that would help them to enjoy the movies. And we know that everybody, every, everyone in New York City, all New Yorkers and all our constituents, they have the right to enjoy what is available in our great city of New York. This is a question of our justice as you know, and I think for we as a society, we have to provide them with the opportunity to enjoy every good thing that we, all the, all the uh, citizens are enjoying in New York City. But uh, knowing these uh, issues or challenges that some people with difficulty, you know, have been facing, what would be your advice or uh, what would be your thoughts to try to accommodate them now or to try to respond to their problem or the problem that they are faced, you know, when they go to the movies in terms of, you know, being able to understand, you know, what is being said in the movie? What, what is, a, 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 what, what is a, the urgent uh, solutions or proposition you would have to resolve the problem right now? It's, it's, a, it's a great, end? yes, absolutely. And it's a great question, Mr. Chairman. I think it goes at the heart of this very issue. Um, we're trying to assess what is the right solution. And to do so, we need actionable data. And we are currently operating in multiple theaters, a pilot project to see what works. We need to find out the right questions to ask, and we need to find out the right methodology to determine what is that right data. As Mr. Waldo has pointed out, in, in some jurisdictions, uh, he, he's looked at the aggregate data. In other words, if you have low open caption turnout, are those other um, theater goers, those patrons going to a non-open caption show? And then in the net, are you seeing a gain? Unfortunately, the experience, and maybe more anecdotal than data, but the experience has seen that if you have a patron going to a movie on a Friday night and they don't like that it's open caption, they don't come back or maybe they don't come back the following Friday or following Saturday. And so we wanna be able to determine that customer behavior, customer behavior for people who do like open captioning and customer behavior for people who do not like open captioning. Unfortunately, the data right now that is currently being assessed in New York City is showing that there is a large number of empty seats, almost 95% of empty seats in the theaters for open caption showtimes. We don't want to see that. Let me just be very, very clear. We would love to have sellouts of open caption seats. And if that's the case, we would have more open captioning. We want this to be market driven. We understand the role of government. Uh, we work very closely with government and most recently worked to promote vaccination across the city in our theaters and outside of our theaters as a way to make sure that we don't have to close down again. And being closed for a year, I can tell you, was extremely difficult. And I know it's extremely frustrating for people from the deaf and hard of hearing community 
to not be able to go to any movie that they want to see or to have difficulties with the closed captioning equipment. We've talked with advocates about ways to both improve the closed captioning experience, possibly using new technology and also ensuring that the devices are fully charged and of course, hygienic. Um, but we wanna make sure that the open captioning availability is a fair and balanced approach for everyone, for all patrons. And there are unfortunately patrons who complain about open captioning. There are patrons who don't like it and the theaters need to be able to respond to their patrons. Um, and that's why we wanna be able to continue with the pilot. We wanna be able to continue talking with the advocates and we wanna find that right balance. We're, we're very willing to um, you know, be dynamic and flexible. If we see that there are more people coming to the open caption shows, the theaters would offer more open caption shows. It's a good problem to have when you have a large population or a large segment of the audience that wants to come. And, it, and that's something that the theaters definitely wanna see. Unfortunately, they just haven't, you know, since this pandemic started and since the theaters have been able to reopen, the, the audience numbers are dismal. The, the, the box office receipts, which are, you know, reported publicly, but they're reported for the whole country and all movie theaters, not just New York City. They, the numbers may seem staggering and it may seem like, oh, these, these movies are making so much money. They're not. Um, and if you do the math and we have the numbers in our, in our testimony, it, it, it's quite dismal. Um, and um, unfortunately, a lot of the audience is, is um, choosing to stay home and we would love for the audience to come to the movies. And I, I can't say it or emphasize it enough, we want people who are deaf and hard of hearing to come to the movies, to feel comfortable, to feel welcome, to feel important and, and come see the movies they want. And, and as, as Randy Smith mentioned, there's no monolithic um, audience. Um, the, all the different genres of movies um, are, are available to everybody. And there's no one type of movie that, that any particular type of audience wants to see. So again, we wanna work with the sponsors. We wanna work with the advocates. We want to find the right solution. This bill is not the right solution. And we think that we can come up with something voluntary that would work much better and enable um, all people to be able to feel comfortable and come to the movies. Thank you very much for the answer. Thank you. And I want to ask also some question, probably one question to the advocates, if they are still uh, here. There's a big issue affecting so many people who are deaf and also hard hearing people in our city. This is a reality. This is a very important and serious issues facing the people who are deaf and also those who are hard hearing people. But, uh, and I want to commend the advocate also and the council member was tell for their advocacy to try to resolve, to address this issue, this very important issue. Because as I said previously, all New Yorkers, all members of the society uh, have the right to enjoy whatever the society or society or our city can offer. But uh, we have heard also the representative from the uh, movie industry, they say that they are not against that. They want to continue the, the conversation and they want to make sure that the people the customer, the, 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 the customers, if they can enjoy the movies like everybody else. My question to the advocates, is there any uh, proposal or anything that you would like to suggest now, like an urgent action from the movie industry to be done in order for those who are deaf and also who are hard of hearing people can enjoy the movies you know, at this moment, as we are trying to find the way to address the very important issues. Is there any proposal or actions you believe that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the movie industry should take right now? Anything you want to say? Any response you want to give? Uh, Chair Eugene, is there any particular advocate you would like to hear from? No, any advocate. Any member from the advocacy, if they are present, if they are still in the zone? Uh, I believe we have uh, Jerry Bergman available. 
Thank you. Uh, Chairman Eugene, could you briefly repeat the question? What I'm saying is that the people who are deaf and also who are hard of hearing people, they are facing a serious issue. And we all know that in our society, we have to do everything possible <coughs> for everyone to get the same access. And also to, to have the opportunity to enjoy everything our society or, or, or city can provide. But the reality is not the case. But the people from the industry, they say that they understand the situation. They are not against uh, open caption. And they are trying to do everything possible to make sure that the people, the customers, can enjoy the movies. But my question to the advocates, hearing what the, the people from the industry say, is there any proposition, anything, any response you want to give in terms of the urgency of the issue? What what should be done in order the, the, for the people who are deaf, who are hard hearing people, can enjoy the movies at the present moment? Here's, here's, a, quick, the, here's a quick answer. We've had two very cordial meetings with Attorney Greller and, uh, he, and the people he represents. And at the second meeting, which just happened yesterday, um, we exchanged proposals, talked about those two proposals. The difference in our positions is that we think a reasonable proposal can be made mandatory, our proposal. And reasonable means all theaters, occasional open caption showings, during the week, day and night, at least one time, and the weekend, day and evening, at least one time. Also taking into account that most people with hearing loss and seniors with difficulty hearing have no interest in the big blockbuster movies. And those are the movies that will make most money for the, the exhibitors. We're interested in the smaller movies and those movies tend to have more empty seats anyway. So I think there's less risk to schedule more open caption showings of those movies. But we also asked this question, which they had no answer for. Why are you basing this solely on tickets and how many seats are sold to open caption performances? I'm not as smart as the executives in the movie industry, the cinema industry, but I have to wonder why they have not done any audience opinion research. They used to give out audience response cards when people come out of a theater. Did you like this movie? What didn't you like about this movie? They haven't done anything like that so far as we know with open captions because we think, because they're afraid it will put them out of business or their membership will, will balk at it and refuse. So we don't even know, I wrote this down to ask Mr. Greller, we don't even know the basis of the pilot test they're running in New York City. Again, Mr. Smith said they're cooperating fully but they sprung this test on us. They didn't ask us, what are we interested in in the way of open captions? How many should they test? Where should they test and so forth? So, you know, we question the criteria which will determine the findings and we'd rather have them do some opinion research, give tickets to senior citizens, bring them in to see open caption movies and ask them if they really would avoid open caption movies. That's all we're asking for. And I think the difference in our positions is we think that our proposal should be made law. Uh, we've submitted it to uh, Council Member Rosenthal and uh, they would prefer their proposal be voluntary. The percentages aren't that much different. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. So uh, I, now I would like to turn it over to the general council, to the uh, committee council. 
Uh, thank, thank you, Chair Eugene. I will actually turn it over to you for any closing remarks you would like to offer. Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, let me say, uh, take the opportunity to thank you, uh, you the general consent, and also the Sergeant at Army and all the staff from the city of New York. And also, I want to thank our council member who's in turn and the advocate and the representative also of the movie theater. Our people in our community and our city are facing a very important issue. Very important issue that affect the quality of life, the well-being. And also the people from the movie industry based on what they said, they understand the issues and they do want to resolve it or to address it. And it, the good thing is, uh, while we are trying to vote this legislation, both sides, they are engaged, they are communicating, and also they, are, uh, you know, they have several opportunities to dialogue and to have a conversation. And uh, I hope that something will happen and can be you know, our compromise before uh, or as soon as possible. And it is a good sign that both sides are in conversations and also the movie theaters and also acknowledge that this is something that they are concerned about and they are doing effort to resolve. So if there is no more uh, statements, I want to declare that this meeting is adjourned. And thank you to all of you for your statement and your testimonies. Thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.